So, hello everyone and um, welcome to our Elixir Bioinformatics Industry Forum. My name is Cathy Lauer, I'm the Elixir Industry Officer and um, yeah, welcome everyone. We have a great turnout today. At the moment we have 74 people um, joining us for the event and uh, I'm really excited to have a great selection of talks today. So I have a confession to make. This is um, the first time I'm running a virtual event and I'm running this event from my kitchen table in my front room. So um, please be kind if not everything goes as planned. So there are a couple of housekeeping details I want to go through with you. Um, the event is being recorded and as you've probably figured out now, um, the control panel is on the top right corner of your screen. To post any questions during the event, please make use of the question box in the control panel and submit your questions. After each presentation, we will then ask a selection of the questions to the presenter. If you have any burning follow-up questions, some of the presenters um, will still be around after the official part of the event. And um, you can then raise your hand in the control panel we will unmute you and you can ask your question. Um, I hope you understand that not everyone will be able to um, maybe stay for the whole duration of the event due to other commitments. Um, and I think in these times, we just all have to be a little bit more understanding that we usually would be then. Um, after you exit the um, conferencing system, you will be presented with a couple of survey questions and it would be really great if you could give us some feedback on the event. Okay, then one more thing for me to say before we move on to the official part of the event, um, that is that if you do not want your contact details to be shared with the other participants, then please send an email to the to this email address and then we can exclude you from um, from this list. Okay, so then um, now we start with the more exciting part of the event and um, this is the presentations and I will go ahead and make a start um, and give you a little introduction on um, what Elixir does and what Elixir is. Okay, so, LXA is an organization that um, coordinates and unites efforts of more than 100 bioinformatics institutes under one umbrella. And at the moment, these institutes are located in 22 member countries, plus, plus the um, European Bioinformatics Institute. So, the coordination of the organization is done by a central hub that hub is based in Cambridge. All the institutes in one country make up something we call a local node and each local node um, then has a lead institute and these are the small blue dots and these lead institutes again then liaise with the central hub in Cambridge. Through those different institutes we can provide resources. They are all openly avail available in the areas of databases, software tools, training materials, um, standards or computing cloud resources. And Alexia's goal here really is to bring bioinformaticians, to bring scientific experts together and streamline their efforts and form a single infrastructure, which is then further conducive to researchers all around the globe. So um, internally, we structure ourselves um, into four, five technical platforms. Um, these are the, I can't count today, five orange circles that you can see in the diagram. So that's compute data interoperability, tools and training. And um, these technical platforms liaise with specific life science communities, um, around particular scientific domains, such as 
plant sciences, for example, um, microbial biotechnology or rare diseases. And these communities are also the places where external experts can contribute to Elixir. Okay, so a large organization like ours, of course, also has an interest to engage with um, the private sector. And um, therefore, we have developed an industry strategy. If you're interested in finding out more about this industry strategy, it is in the control panel in the handout section. There you can find the detailed um, document. So the aims or why we want to um, engage with, with industry and how we engage with industry are um, to facilitate collaborations between researchers in academia and industry. Um, particularly around cross-sectoral challenges. We want to demonstrate the impact that these open resources that are provided by Elixir, what kind of impact they have for innovation in the life sciences, and of course then ultimately what value they have for society at large. And to achieve this, um, we of course want to increase the use and the usefulness of Elixir's infrastructure services and make sure that open innovation on top of those services is possible. And finally, um, we really try to build capacity in our local Elixir nodes and support them so they know how to engage effectively with the private sector and this um, cross-sectoral knowledge exchange can happen. So in summary, um, we address of these aims through various different activities and all those activities are open to everyone and um, these activities really drive the whole machinery that our industry engagement is. So now I'll give you um, some examples of those activities and I make a start with one of our flagship projects, the Elixir Biohackathon. The Elixir Biohackathon is a week-long event, it's open to everyone and it is an event where technical experts can get together to work on predefined projects. Um, these projects are pre-selected by a scientific committee. And in fact, if you're interested in participating, you can still do so. And um, the submission of project proposals is really lightweight. It will take you not more than 10 minutes and can still be done until the end of this month. We hope that we can still hold this event in November this year. So yeah, please have a look. Um, more information is available online on our website. Then as part of our portfolio, we also offer a series of networking events. The Bioinformatics Industry Forum is one of these events. And particularly with this type of event, we want to build a community of bioinformaticians and technical experts that really get together and learn about visionary new ideas and um, discuss bottlenecks and solutions. And um, yeah, just really, we want to bring people together to move science forward. And on the slide, you can see a couple of pictures from previous events. Um, of course, this year we won't get um, one of those pictures, but um, it's an interesting challenge. And who knows, maybe in the future, um, we will move to more virtual events, depending on how this goes. Right, so um, this was my part in my introduction. Thank you very much. I will be around after the official part of the program, and you can ask um, industry-related questions or questions about Elixir then. And um, I will now hand over to my colleague, Fotis. Fotis is based in our Greek node, and um, I think in Thessaloniki, and I had a cheeky look at the weather in Thessaloniki, and it's a lot better than what the UK has to offer today. Fotos will talk about um, a new way in Elixir to tackle hot, hot topics in a fast and agile way. Um, so this is something we call focus groups, and um, yeah, I guess, Fotis, the stage is now yours. Let me just make you a presenter and 
then you can go ahead telling us more about the machine learning focus group. Hi, um, thanks, Kathy. Um, I hope everyone can hear me fine. Um, my apologies for not opening the um, my video. Uh, the uh, the bandwidth is not as good as I had liked, and I want to make sure that this is a seamless experience for everyone joining this uh, virtual session. Uh, thank you also for the introduction. Uh, the weather is indeed great here in Thessaloniki, and um, I wish I could only enjoy it more to go outside. Um, it will happen, I guess, soon enough. So um, again, as Scott said, um, I am a researcher at the Institute of Applied Biosciences in Thessaloniki uh, in Greece, uh, also part of the Elixir Greek Node. And um, the focus of this uh, short talk is going to be um, introducing the um, almost newly formed machine learning uh, focus group. Uh, just a quick outline of the timeline of this of this focus group. Um, it's uh, although there have been a lot of discussions around machine learning within the Elixir um, wider community for quite some time, uh, more focus discussions started um, about a year ago during the annual Elixir All Hands meeting uh, in Lisbon, uh, where we started um, getting more interest about pushing forward with uh, machine learning within uh, life sciences. Um, this initial idea sort of matured uh, around September um, uh, by effort of the Elixir Hub. Um, and um, sort of a first focus group came to be um, by the end of that month. Uh, incidentally, at the end of September 2019, there was a Nature Reviewers uh, Molecular Cell Biology article uh, from David Jones about setting the standards for machine learning biology which was very fortunate because one of the um, points that was raised near the conclusion was that um, having an on-submission checklist for machine learning in, um, in scientific papers may be a good starting point um, for, a, um, for looking into uh, within this focus group. So this led to uh, our first kick of meeting uh, of the focus group in October. Since then, we had eight meetings and um, around November, we also submitted a machine learning focus group for, the, for this um, year's all hands meeting that will happen uh, in June, again, virtually. Uh, throughout these efforts, however, we also focused a lot on, on, on this discussion from, on, from this paper and focusing a lot of doing, uh, figuring out what the recommendations for machine learning could be. And this led to a very soon submission to Nature Methods in March, um, uh, with uh, with the title uh, of Dome and Recommendations for Machine Learning and Validation in Biology. So what Dome stands for, and I have to thank Zinia uh, for this awesome uh, graphic, is based on the four major pillars of machine learning, which is data optimization, model, and validation. As you can see. For all those points, uh, machine learning has specific applications across different aspects in, in life sciences, from, from cell to genome to proteome and to, um, to system biology, metabolism, and so forth. So all those are aspects that have a direct application uh, for machine learning. And of course, applying machine learning to that, uh, looking through literature, you can, you can see that there is significant impact across various different stages from uh, coming from medical decisions um, and um, and to personalize and precision medicine, uh, trying to figure out associations between different omics, phenotypic um, information and so forth. So machine learning is becoming a powerful tool across um, across life science, but at the same time, because of, of, of this um, widespread use, at the same time, some specific um, recommendations should be put forward so that um, any machine learning approach and machine learning application can be evaluated in a consistent manner. So what do each of these letters correspond to? So for data, um, we have a specific list of questions um, that focus around what are the data that is used for building, building the machine learning model. And this comes uh, to uh, discussing aspects like provenance. Um, how the data is split uh, so that the uh, particular model can be trained, if there's a redundancy between different data splits, and of course, uh, how one can farm the data and, and, and use it. 
In terms of optimization, um, this is a, a wide range uh, where there is a lot of, of, of um, variation across literature. And this comes uh, to, uh, of course, this, the algorithm itself, including parameters, uh, how the configuration of this model has been done, uh, but at the same time, also taking aspects like how well this is fitted to, to the data, how this process has been performed, how the feature selections are prefer, performed, and, and so forth. In terms of model, uh, given that everything else has been done at the same time, uh, you need to, to acknowledge how well this model can be uh, interpreted afterwards. It's, it's a black box or it's something that can be reused to get insights from the uh, data that has been produced. Um, also, if you want to retrain, reproduce the model, how long this will take, and essentially, if the actual software is available so people can reuse it, cite it, acknowledge its existence, and so forth. And finally, in terms of evaluation, um, how the evaluation has actually been performed, uh, including the method, method, performance measures, how it's compared against other methods, other data sets, and um, how this evaluation can be available to, to uh, all other people. So these all are questions as um, roughly put as part of a uh, checklist, mental or otherwise, um, while considering to uh, perform machine learning and publish machine learning um, around a particular subject. Um, this is under review, so hopefully um, it will come out soon enough and we can have um, even more work done on that. So um, moving away from the timeline and focusing more on the actual goals of this of this group, um, it, it, it has it does have uh, five main um, goals, which include standards, reproducibility, benchmarking, training, and integration within the wider Elixir community. I'll start with saying a few words for each. Um, so standards uh, focuses a lot on the best practices, and uh, part of this effort that culminated with the data paper. Um, actually is, uh, falls under this particular goal. So beyond best practices, standards also include uh, talking about what is the controlled um, vocabulary, the terms, uh, and, um, and how they can be utilized in order to describe machine learning model, machine learning processes, and uh, to share this uh, within the community. In terms of representativity, the goal is um, to define what the best practices for actually developing machine learning um, approaches, methods, how to share those across um, across different groups, and how to build upon the works of others. And this includes both the software and uh, the model itself. Of course, having standards and reproducibility is one thing, but you also need to ensure that a machine learning uh, process uh, is tested, is evaluated against other, uh, other situations. So here, one of the goals of this group is actually to establish also benchmarking. And this includes uh, all aspects of the machine learning process, from um, how to have a gold standard in data, so against which someone can test the machine learning model, as well as um, in terms of the machine learning model itself, what would be the gold uh, standard in putting together a machine learning process, how to evaluate it, and so forth. Uh, the other two main points uh, of training integration, training is how to produce training material, uh, for machine learning, this is an ongoing activity within the, the uh, within Elixir, also in collaboration with the training platform. And finally, the integration goal focuses a lot on how um, any insights, any uh, activities within this group can be extended throughout all um, existing and ongoing activities in Elixir. So uh, to the most interesting point, uh, how can anyone get involved? So uh, given that this is a focus group, uh, a participation from outside the strict Elixir um, uh, community is, uh, is very encouraged. And there are two main ways one can get involved. So you can be uh, an adopter or you can be a member. Uh, the main difference is that as an adopter, you, get, um, you can take the output of anything that comes out from, uh, from this focus group and um, utilize it um, and basically rely on the high level quality produced within, um, within Elixir. As a member, uh, you can have a more active role within the uh, group itself, help save those policies, recommendations, spec classes, and benchmarking protocols to ensure that this is um, aligned to uh, both uh, the interest of, of and the expertise that anyone can, can bring in. 
Um, so in terms of standards, the involvement, um, as I said, in, in, in includes how to identify the metrics and how to define a set of terms. In terms of reproducibility, what are the best practices to ensure that a machine learning process is fair, uh, as well as ensuring that uh, all practices for research software development and is and, uh, tier two, and therefore ensuring that this is widely adopted by the community and get picked up. And benchmarking, as I said, how to define a clear benchmark process, how to implement this, how to define, and most importantly, how to standardize this so it's it's um, it's widely used. So this is a, a very brief, hopefully um, useful outline of what the focus group is currently active on. As I said, this is a fairly new group. It started uh, less than a year ago, but as you can see, we we have um, moved quite fast along the way because of this huge interest in, in moving this forward. And we would love to have even more people join and have more um, interactions, more effects to that. Uh, I'll try to stick around uh, after the end of the um, of this uh, of the official end of the session. Uh, but I'm more than happy um, to for people to reach out, join us into the um, into the Fox group. The mailing list is open, and um, connect and work together. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Fotis, for your presentation. We um, had a couple of questions come in from the audience. So um, one question asked is, um, what will be the next steps for the DOME recommendations once they are published? All right, that is an excellent question. So the first, um, the first point would be to see how these can be aligned to, to metrics. Um, so the recommendations themselves are a form of a checklist, if you like. So there are two directions from then onwards. Of course, this is part of an ongoing discussion. Um, one way could be to um, have this as a formal checklist to be included in any machine learning process. Um, on the other set, uh, we can think of ways that um, these recommendations can be further defined into concise, measurable activities, actions, that can then be costly part of a metric system. I hope this is addressing the question somehow. Mm -hmm, yeah, and then um, another one that came in was if you are um, liaising with any other machine learning initiatives or groups around those recommendations and beyond the focus group. So, um, so for the time being, most of the discussions has been uh, within uh, the focus group, although we do have people from outside the strict Elixir community participating, actively participating to, to this. Uh, that being said, um, we do encourage people from any other community to join and provide their input and feedback on that. Um, it, have, discussing about standards and best practices in machine learning effects in life sciences is something we often of an ongoing process and of our interest. So having more voices chime in is, is something that we definitely want. Great. So one more question, maybe. So there is um, from Sergio. Beyond publications, would the DOME guidelines be used in future patent applications of machine learning software? Right, so that's an excellent question. Um, we haven't really discussed this um, in terms of patenting the actual uh, guidelines, recommendations. However, it's definitely worth investigating how this can be further incorporated into activities of industry, um, which is uh, part of the first goal as well, how to define the best practices and standards in machine learning. Okay, thank you. Then um, thank you again for your presentation. And um, I think we move on in the program now. Jen. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, I'm Jen Harrow. I'm the Tools Platform Coordinator. And um, it gives me a, a great delight to introduce uh, Ian Doherty as our keynote. Um, and, and while I introduce him, Kathy, if you can uh, set up Aidan's slides would be great. Um, 
Aidan is a senior research fellow at the University of Oxford and also group leader at the Big Data Institute, as well as an associated researcher at the Health uh, Data Research UK. His main research in, uh, interests are around developing reproducible computational methods to analyze data from wearable sensors and for large health studies to really understand the causes of disease. And so um, it, it's really great to um, introduce him and he will be speaking about why we need reproducible machine learning to support trustworthy clinical insights. Aidan, please take it away. Um, so, so, so thank you very much for the for the uh, invite in this. Uh, and was with great uh, interest there. I, I really enjoyed uh, Bultus's presentation there too, just to find out what the Elixir community is doing around machine learning. And and today I'll present, uh, I guess, very much then on the the health record side of things. So I'm uh, closely involved with Health Data Research UK, which is the uh, uh, has been set up as essentially the, the nation's uh, health data science uh, research institute and, and we've got a, a, a very keen interest in, in machine learning and particularly around reproducible machine learning to support trustworthy clinical insights and to uh, give an outline over the next 25 minutes, first of all, I'll talk about why we've got an interest in machine learning uh, on the phenotype uh, uh, side of things, uh, and then just introducing uh, why uh, that we believe there's actually a, a pretty large unsolved problem around reproducible machine learning and, and, and the reproducibility crisis that uh, is um, effervescent in science uh, is also very much prevalent uh, within uh, health data science as well. Uh, and then finally, just to share with you a, a national program that we've recently set up uh, and to share with you uh, some of the plans we have over the coming uh, years then to try and address this very large problem. Um, why might we be interested in machine learning? Well, the uh, the area that's very close to my own heart is around wearable sensors and health. And the motivation for these is that it's pretty well understood that, uh, that insufficient levels of physical activity uh, are associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, breast cancer, colon cancer, uh, etc. Um, and the same uh, uh, evidence base exists for sleep, whereby having less than seven hours of sleep per night or more than nine hours of sleep per night are associated um, with, with adverse health outcomes. But unfortunately, uh, from a public health and policy point of view, there are some very severe limitations to this evidence base. Um, first of all, that uh, current uh, uh, UK Chief Medical Officer guidelines in physical activity have essentially relied on subjective measures of activity, i.e. asking people what they do rather than directly measuring it. And these measures aren't just a little bit wrong, they're seriously wrong. Um, so for example, as we can see in the slide on the left hand side, uh, when trying to assess the amount of adults who meet physical activity guidelines, uh, when, uh, when one asks people how much they do versus directly measuring it with a wearable sensor, uh, we get dramatically different uh, answers. Um, and, uh, so, and of course this begs the answer of which of the two is correct and there's uh, certainly no doubt that from, uh, uh, from a range of studies that the wearable sensing devices give us a much closer answer to the underlying uh, true uh, measure of what one is doing in terms of their physical activity status. Uh, and as well uh, these uh, devices haven't been linked to clinical outcomes seriously. Um, so so with, uh, within Health Data Research UK and at Oxford, um, we played a leading role with UK Biobank in terms of measuring uh, uh, physical activity and sleep information in 100,000 uh, individuals um, uh, using risk-worn devices called the accelerometers. Think of them as research-grade Fitbit devices. And the beauty of this being part of the UK Biobank is there's a range of other uh, genotypic and phenotypic information on these individuals and an additional uh, linkage at clinical outcomes, which is the key thing that we're interested in. And there's a really hard challenge here because these wearable devices uh, capture approximately 180 million data points per person per week um, times 100,000 individuals. So there's a real uh, 
that informatics challenge in terms of trying to identify from the movement traces from these devices and as to be able to understand when a person is sitting versus walking versus running versus sleeping. Um, and, and it's in this regard that machine learning is very well suited uh, to help identify these um, uh, uh, very, uh, very difficult patterns and trying to understand patterns and signatures in these to identify activity type. And uh, so, uh, so, so our group and others then have developed um, uh, statistical machine learning uh, methods and namely uh, um, uh, uh, random forest classifiers and smoothed over with hidden Markov models uh, to identify, uh, first of all, in a training and validation data set around 150 individuals. And the key thing to uh, highlight here is that uh, these have been developed in free living environments, not constrained on realistic laboratory environments. Um, so, so first of all, our, the methods uh, have been validated in these sort of gold standard free living environment. And then most usefully, uh, this helps us construct uh, a 24 hour model of what human physical activity behaviours look like in 91,000 UK biobank participants. Uh, to orientate you on the graph here, uh, on the top right hand side, uh, x axis is our day, y axis is probability of being in one of these behavioural states. Um, so we can see quite reassuringly at 4 a.m. Uh, most of the population are asleep, so that uh, gives us further confidence that our uh, machine learning model has got some form of face validity at least. Um, and of course then this allows us, uh, being part of the biobank, we can look at the genetic determinants against these machine learned wearable sensor uh, phenotypes. Uh, and by linking up uh, the machine learned variables with the uh, genetic information, it allows us to conduct Mendelian randomization analysis for causal inference to show that higher levels of activity uh, are associated with, a, uh, an in, with a decreased or sorry, an increased odds of uh, having been diagnosed with hypertension or depression. Uh, and as well, uh, linking up these machine learned phenotypes to uh, clinical outcomes, i.e. future cardiovascular disease events, uh, it is showing that uh, our previous understanding based on just the self-reported information has really underestimated the true role of physical activity and there's a manuscript in preparation on that. So machine learning is clearly uh, very helpful in this one particular area uh, to help elicit new insights um, into uh, uh, behavioural um, uh, uh, phenotypes uh, and as to how they are linked to clinical outcomes. And of course, this isn't the only area in which uh, machine learning is of, is of interest. And we, uh, of course, uh, have got a, a strong belief that machine learning has the possibility to transform medicine in general, uh, whereby uh, in general, the data generation and data acquisition is becoming really cheap. So I've talked about the UK Biobank, there are obviously lot other very large initiatives, uh, uh, particularly uh, such as the 100,000 Genomes Project, uh, of which might be extend to, extended to a 5 million person cohort uh, over, the, over the coming years. There's been an explosion of wearables uh, um, and imaging, electronic health records, etc. And um, well, we're becoming quite instant machine learning. First of all, with these very vast data sets, but in addition, uh, it's coupled with increases in sort of raw computing power, particularly through the graphics processing units, GPUs, that, that are really um, uh, helping uh, exponentiate the amount of compute that we can do on these data sets. And the, I guess the interesting thing is that uh, if I plucked a machine learning researcher out right back from the early 1980s and somehow magically transforward them 40 years forward to the present, they would still be able to read the manuscripts we do. So the underlying methods such as deep neural networks aren't particularly dissimilar to those used in the early 1980s. So the transformation is really driven by just uh, huge volumes of data and also uh, a real uh, increased uh, computing capacity as well in terms of GPUs. And the particular areas uh, of clinical medicine we believe 
uh, machine learning can add substantial value it are generally those areas that are we're dealing with this high dimensional multimodal data and where it's quite cryptic and hard to define particular features so we're thinking of areas such as imaging the, the wearable sensing uh, time series data i talked about and also uh, free text uh, electronic health records and I've showed the example of wearable sensing um, and how machine learning can help uh, elicit new insights there. Uh, but in addition, um, uh, another very uh, key exemplar area of, of machine learning is showing huge promise to support diagnostic decisions. Uh, here we can see in diabetic retinopathy, um, uh, for anyone uh, who might have been watching the Royal Society Christmas lectures, uh, uh, we've been seeing Pierce Keane from uh, the Murphy's Eye Clinic uh, showing some of the very nice work they're doing along with the Google DeepMind team uh, in terms of uh, doing image analysis of, uh, 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 of retina scan images uh, to, to diagnose uh, uh, diabetic retinopathy versus not. And on the right hand side, um, the, the blue line shows performance of the algorithm and the, the dotted circle, well, R1, R2, R3, and you know, O3, O4, etc., are looking at the performance of the, of the algorithm versus uh, individual clinicians, uh, showing that it's uh, achieving a, apparent or, or very near uh, or sometimes better than a, a clinician level performance. So showing a lot of promise. So there's a lot of interest uh, around the use of machine learning to support diagnostic decision making. Uh, another uh, a very nice example is uh, machine learning and offering promise for risk prediction. So for stratification of patients. Um, so uh, again, an example from the DeepMind group at Google uh, with a paper published in Nature last year uh, analyzing electronic healthcare record data uh, for acute kidney injury um, and to identify uh, whether uh, patients are at an increased risk uh, and the uh, I guess the headlines were showing that this model might give a 48 hour warning of uh, these acute kidney injuries um, uh, and again it's a nice example of the um, of the utility of a promise uh, for machine learning methods uh, for risk prediction. Uh, and of course, um, uh, one might uh, then be interested in trying to predict more uh, serious or acute uh, outcomes, then, such as uh, chronic kidney disease. Um, but, but acute kidney injury is a nice starter then uh, on this pathway. But despite all this problems, we need to be really careful when using these machine learning methods. Um, for example, uh, we looked at the, the physical activity, uh, trying to identify um, uh, activities of daily living from time series, wrist-worn uh, sensor data. It works apparently very well in many of the populations, but for some populations, such as those who are dialysis participants, um, who are a really, really inactive group of participants, um, who don't do that much moderate activity or walking. Um, and then if, for example, we blindly apply uh, a machine, an off-the-shelf uh, machine learning method trained in healthy individuals, it doesn't perform very well. So um, first of all, don't be uh, fooled by saying an overall accuracy classification, 74%. Um, accuracy is not a good metric um, for multi-class uh, outcomes. Uh, campus statistic is much more uh, appropriate uh, an evaluation metric. And we can see here the machine learning method has been quite lazy and, and assigned people has been uh, uh, over assigned people into the sedentary class. So uh, so, so, so the, uh, it's important to train the, uh, these pop, um, methods uh, in a diverse range of populations and then test them in those uh, diverse range of populations as well. And even more worrying for the image-based um, uh, machine learning uh, approaches uh, is that if we introduce a very small amount of noise uh, into the images, it can uh, create some serious uh, prediction or, or classification errors uh, in these methods. So this is a really nice example from a science paper published um, last year 
uh, looking at a machine learning method to uh, identify uh, um, uh, benign versus malignant uh, skin lesions. Um, so on the left hand side we've got the original image, um, that's a benign image, and the machine learning method is uh, very confident of that too, uh, as indicated in the uh, blue and red bars up to the bottom left. If one then introduces just a small bit of noise to that image, this is just a very small bit of random noise um, introduced into the image uh, and, and to uh, also as humans comparing the image, the original image on the left and adversarial example on the right, uh, there's no noticeable uh, difference. Um, however, this perturbation uh, to the image uh, has for some reason then caused the machine learning method um, to suddenly be highly confident that this is not a malignant uh, um, skin lesion uh, and, and therefore should be forwarded up for further investigation. So we've got to be really careful uh, in our um, in our deployment of machine learning uh, methods in clinical medicine, uh, we've, uh, and this is really important to ensure A, credibility and B, trustworthiness uh, of these methods. Um, and, and, and indeed, there's a broad concern around the, this lack of reproducibility, uh, replic replicability, and robustness in science. Um, for example, an openly used uh, 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 intensive care database, the MIMIC database. Um, uh, there was an, uh, a nice paper recently published um, uh, that reviewed uh, the uses of this uh, publicly open database uh, and it's found a really large deviation in reporting something even as simple as the sample sizes used, um, uh, something that we would expect uh, uh, pretty much all publications come up with the same uh, starting population and already we're getting differences in, in, in that. Um, uh, so that's quite worrying itself. Then a, a really nice uh, a neuroimaging uh, study that one of my colleagues at uh, Tom Nichols at Oxford um, has uh, investigated trying to achieve the same task but on the same data but using different tools and again, it's finding a huge amount of heterogeneity between tools with these uh, dice coefficients range from 0 to 0.74 in comparisons by completing the same task. Um, so there's a really uh, large issue uh, around uh, um, reproducibility uh, in, uh, in health data science. Um, and, and some of my colleagues at the Alan Turing Institute have uh, developed this very nice sort of two by two uh, table uh, to, uh, uh, to make sure we're always talking about the same uh, terminology or we're talking about the same things in the same way. Um, looking when, when one discusses reproducibility versus replicability versus robustness versus generalizability. And the, there's a, and part of this reproducibility crisis, um, there's an issue around the reporting of machine learning in medicine. It's not standardized um, and they're often prone uh, to hype. So here's a, a, a paper published in uh, Nature's Digital Medicine Journal from around 18 months ago and had claimed that the uh, use of uh, deep learning methods uh, had offered a transformational uh, advance over the traditional uh, uh, logistic regression method. Um, and uh, for example, the text in the paper on the left hand side says that these models outperform traditional clinically uh, used predictive models in all cases. However, then when one uh, delves into the supplementary tables, um, uh, if we look very carefully through, uh, even in the top line and for inpatient mortality, the, the area under the recurve, so we've got our deep learning methods um, uh, with the uh, area under the recurve score of 0.95 in hospital A. Uh, if we look just one line below, so this is uh, using uh, basically all the available features in the logistic regression, uh, we see what are an, uh, hazard ratio or, or sort of an area on the curve of 0.93 and we look at the confidence intervals they actually overlap. Um, so, so instead of uh, the authors here I guess uh, really promoting the use of deep learning I think a more positive uh, um, view of this paper would be that if one does very careful uh, data pro uh, pre-processing and curation that it's possible then to use interpretable, interpretable methods such as logistic regression uh, to achieve a performance uh, equivalent uh, to the use of uh, um, 
hard uh, to interpret a deep learning methods um, and this is why we I think, really need standardized reporting of these methods that uh, provide some guidance to authors um, so that we can, can I guess uh, fairly assess um, uh, a scientific literature uh, for the use of uh, machine learning uh, in, in, uh, in clinical medicine. Um, as, as well as a large issue around data sharing that's uh, rarely done uh, and, and very uh, and quite often restricted um, because to enable reproducibility we like to share not only code but also data in which to run that code um, often quite difficult in clinical medicine uh, but I think we need some solutions to this and this is a very uh, interesting paper here that I'll not go into uh, detail on just given the uh, interests of time and in addition, many of my colleagues in Health Data Research UK, uh, when we're analysing data, we often do it in restricted safe haven environments, uh, whereby it's hard to use some of the uh, off-the-shelf tools that one might use, uh, immediately think of using for reproducibility. Again, a very nice article in JAMA explaining uh, some of the, uh, the, uh, the issues and challenges here. And perhaps more seriously, there's just not an ingrained culture of reproducible practices uh, when using uh, uh, reproducible machine or when uh, when conducting machine learning in health data science. Um, uh, so, for example, uh, uh, here even within the field of AI, uh, it's showing that only six percent presenters uh, share their algorithms code. We might think that would be one of the leading fields, so one can imagine it's even worse in within the field of health data science. Um, and, uh, and over on the right, then uh, the author uh, elaborates on some of the reasons uh, as to why people might not be sharing their code. Um, uh, and uh, eventually, could be coming back to the old um, ho homework excuse of the dog at my program, uh, perhaps. But there's certainly a systemic problem in uh, not sharing code um, or data, and I think we really need to, to address this. So to Health Data Research UK, then uh, we just recently set up a, a national project then to uh, really interrogate whether reproducible machine learning can be embedded in UK health data science to, to support trustworthy clinical insights. Um, and there are four main areas we're looking at. First, how should uh, researchers report the use of machine learning in health data science? Secondly, can synthetic data sets be used um, for sharing of data? Um, and of course, I need to, first of all, uh, evaluate whether they can be used uh, for stable uh, machine learning. Uh, thirdly, we're interested in whether, uh, as to what the minimal requirements are for reproducibility in these restricted safe haven environments when we're, actually, when we're accessing NHS data sets. Uh, and then finally, uh, and I think quite critically, then can we initiate a culture of reproducible machine learning across the UK at least? And, and to briefly uh, introduce Health Data Research UK, so it's um, a large government in initiative. Um, so the headquarters is at the Wellcome Trust, um, but it's actually a distributed in, in institute uh, uh, dotted around the location shown in the map with the main sites being in, in Oxford, in Cambridge, in London. Uh, there's a Scot Scotland wide site, Wales and Northern Ireland combined together, uh, and also there's a Midland site as well. So, um, and it, it brings together a very large body of researchers uh, sort of across a, a range of areas of expertise, um, mostly focused on clinical phenotyping, but also some interest uh, around uh, the area of genetics and uh, led by John Dinesh in Cambridge. And uh, we set up this reproducible machine learning project. There's a, a website that one can follow then to find uh, a bit more information on that and to, to briefly uh, introduce what we uh, will do. Uh, I think one thing is quite unique uh, is that uh, we are collaborating closely with so uh, Sophie Spinesco then in Warwick, uh, who has uh, led a lot of the PPI uh, public and patient involvement activities uh, for NIHR or National Institute for Health Research. Uh, and we'll be creating uh, what we believe with first uh, sort of patient group uh, with an interest around reproducible machine learning and health. And, and the aim here would be really to create a, a framework uh, to 
uh, to guide patient and public involvement in health data to inform future studies in this area. So we first of all need to be able to convince uh, patients and the public um, uh, that, that, that this is uh, an important area and also to get feedback from them on this. And in terms of the reporting guidelines, uh, Gary Collins, uh, 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 Director of the Centre for Statistics Medicine uh, at Oxford, is leading a set of reporting guidelines called Tripod ML. Some of you might be familiar with Tripod. It's the uh, guidance and statements that researchers for risk prediction models ought to follow. Uh, we are going to extend this uh, for to be more tailored for the machine learning community. And there's already a, um, an opinion piece uh, that Gary has written in The Lancet uh, um, roughly about a year ago, uh, talking about these efforts on reporting of uh, artificial intelligence prediction models. And secondly, around synthetic data sets, um, uh, we will be uh, very uh, closely then looking at, uh, at, at GAN's general adversarial networks um, uh, to critically evaluate uh, whether we can uh, A, uh, generate synthetic data and B, whether that can be still useful for researchers uh, more widely than in which to develop methods. Um, and the idea, I guess, is that we will not be generating new health insights in these, but uh, creating a platform on which uh, to support and facilitate a reproducible machine learning so that people then can eventually take that to their NHS data set or their wearable sensor uh, data set uh, and, and then easily uh, deploy uh, some of these uh, uh, cutting edge uh, methods, machine learning methods. So here we'll be creating tools to integrate code and privacy preserving databases, data sets. Uh, then Catalina Vallejos in the University of Edinburgh um, will be leading efforts around investigating the minimal requirements for reproducibility in restricted safe haven environments. Um, because we can't use tools such as Docker here, so we'll, we'll investigate, um, for example, unit, uh, unit tests for data analysis to see how they can be embedded in machine learning workflows and safe haven environments. And our exemplar here will be uh, working in NHS Scotland data uh, to predict uh, uh, readmission to, uh, for, for hospitalizations. Uh, and again, here we'll be developing open tools to support reproducible machine learning in restricted safe haven environments. And on my second last slide here then, and for our last aim, talking about this issue of trying to initiate a culture of reproducible machine learning within the UK. Uh, somewhat similar, I guess, to uh, what you're doing, Elixir, then uh, we would uh, uh, creating data on workshops to A, create an awareness around reproducible machine learning, B, show how to use some of these reporting guidelines we're uh, developing, and C, to provide hands on experience using exemplar tools and data sets. Um, in addition, we're creating a reproducibility ambassador program uh, whereby we'll have reproducibility ambassadors uh, embedded at different sites throughout the UK. And finally, we'll be contributing uh, uh, closely along with our colleagues at the Alan Turing Institute to their Turing Way handbook. Um, for anybody interested in machine learning and reproducibility practices, this is a really nice resource and I'd encourage you to go and look at it uh, even now in its current form. So to wrap up, um, I hope that I've convinced you today that uh, A, uh, clinical medicine, machine learning uh, it has got a lot of promise we ought to do it really carefully. There's, uh, and particularly, it needs to be done uh, in a reproducible manner. Uh, and I've highlighted here some of the areas that uh, that Health Data Research UK is a national institute will be contributing on. We're really open uh, to working uh, with other people in the Elixir community or in the industry uh, or, or industrial colleagues as well. And I've been delighted to hear any uh, questions or feedback you might have. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Aidan. That was a fantastic talk. Really comprehensive. Really enjoyed it. Um, just a reminder, if you want to put some questions in the question box, um, we'll take them and add. I'll, I'll start with the first question that we've noted. Um, one, um, which other countries do you think are in pole position in adopting machine learning applications in the clinic? And why do you think that is? Is it because the government's behind it or private sector? Um, I think we're actually in a really good position here in the UK. Um, some of the world leading examples I've given are actually the uh, Google uh, DeepMind examples. Um, uh, 
and working very closely, for example, with the Murphy's Eye uh, Clinic uh, Hospital uh, for the diabetic retinopathy. Now, of course, it's really important that uh, we uh, treat uh, patient data with uh, the utmost care and concern, but, but uh, we've got a really, I, I think, leading life sciences uh, industry here in the UK. So I believe we're in, in real pole position to be a potential world leader in this area. And, and I think there's a real, um, uh, appetite will a to make sure we we treat uh, NHS data uh, in the uh, said it, I, uh, as carefully as possible, but b I think there's a real openness and working together with industry then to try and solve some of the really large problems we have, and c an openness I think to uh, perform uh, uh, machine learning uh, uh, methods uh, within this data. Uh, um, through, through initiatives such as Health Data Research UK and also the Alan Turing Institute. So I'm actually very hopeful that, that, that here in the UK we're, in a, we're currently sitting in pole position, but we uh, obviously ought to, um, uh, to exploit that as well. Great. Um, the second question, how do you think this is touching on kind of uh, code sharing? How do you think we could encourage code sharing within the health se sector? To encourage reproducibility, especially kind of on an elixir front as well. Um, so, for uh, uh, speaking of my academic hat on, first mm -hmm. of all, um, the uh, I would like to see, I guess, more uh, journals uh, expected uh, as uh, or to, for there to be a more embedded culture. First of all, for uh, if one submits one's paper that uh, we also submit, I know, a link to a GitHub repository associated with that. And I would have been uh, um, not so hopeful for that uh, a couple of years ago, but I think it's, it is starting to slowly creep more into the uh, conscience, at least of health data scientists and you know, health data research. Here, we're quite keen to, to uh, really build on top of that then by offering these training opportunities for, for more junior researchers. Um, uh, but, but there certainly is a lot of work to do, and I suspect we probably don't uh, truly understand all the uh, motivators and barriers uh, around the code sharing and probably more work needs to be done on that too. Great, a uh, question from Effie, is it possible that the coding is just too complicated for the software engineers to understand and deconvoluted? Is this issue related to reproducibility? Uh, I think there, there certainly is a, a, an issue um, whereby uh, sometimes people are a little bit embarrassed uh, to share their code because they, they, they might think, oh, this is um, not very clean and curated. Uh, everybody will think really badly of me, of me when sharing it. Um, so, so there certainly is uh, that issue. Um, but I think this is where the, then it's really important of good training practices. Uh, and I think we need to mostly uh, embrace a culture that, that it's OK to share uh, code that might not be perfect um, and of course one of the uh, fundamentals and I believe one of our uh, last speakers and we'll talk about it having an open science community then can actually others can come in and, uh, and help one uh, I guess optimize their code and, and contribute to it as well so so again this comes back to this cultural issue that that, that uh, will take a long time to address but I think it's important we start to make some first steps on it. Brilliant. Uh, Sergio Martinez is asking, just like genome sequences are deposited to databases such as EBI, why is there still no global database for host machine learning models upon publication? Um, there are already resources such as biomodels for system biology and Kipo for predictive models and genomics. So um, why are they not using them? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, so I guess I, I'll speak, uh, say, about my own area of wearable sensing. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are a, a very, a very small number of, of available data, openly available data sets. And, and in that area, particularly for risk prediction of, of, uh, of clinical electronic health record data, often we're just not allowed to share that data because it's um, uh, patient level data. Um, uh, it wouldn't meet our privacy or ethics requirements to share that. So I think that's why it's really important. We need to start looking at the possible use of synthetic data sets um, uh, to, to, to share this. So it's not quite, I think, as simple as sharing uh, uh, anything. You'd say, for example, that's uh, uh, summary stats data from a GWAS, um, which is non-identifiable. It's, it's quite a lot harder to do that for risk prediction of clinical uh, electronic health record data. So th that's why I said we're looking at this uh, use of 
uh, synthetic data sets. Um, I think it might be quite difficult for us um, to, to match you um, uh, in the Elixir community and the, and the wonderful uh, data resources uh, and open data resources you have, but it certainly is something we should strive to get closer towards. And probably our final question from Toldy Wildish. Um, are there any really big social issues around the acceptance of machine learning in healthcare and with the healthcare professionals, patients or public? Um, I believe uh, there's a lot more work to be done to, uh, to ensure that uh, we to make these uh, methods trustworthy. So sometimes it is really difficult to trust what in many ways is essentially a black box. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we uh, said that we would ideally like to use interpretable methods, but quite often, particularly in imaging applications, these uh, deep learning slash black box methods do work particularly well. So uh, and I believe the what's really needed for these methods in the longer term is, uh, is somewhat similar to uh, if introducing a new drug, uh, we need a randomized control trial to, uh, to judge whether it's effective or not. And the same thing I think is needed for uh, machine learning in, in, in clinical medicine. We need to have randomized control trials comparing these methods versus standard and usual care. And then we'll have gold standard evidence uh, as to whether these are actually effective and helpful um, and will have information side effects uh, etc as well so, so so i think we really need randomized control trials longer term and that will i think give clinicians a, a, a lot more reassurance uh, around the use of these methods but to get there uh, we need to and make the uh, the active ingredient for such interventions as trustworthy as possible or to, to give it the best chance of success. Um, so I think that's why we really need this uh, work around reproducibility. Thank you very much for the presentation, Aid, and, and, and for a wonderful uh, discussion session at the, the end. And I'll pass over now back to Cathy. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chen. Um, so yeah, let's move on to our next session. So in this session, we have four talks and um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Tom Whitehead. Tom is head of machine learning at Intelligence, a small company that is based here in Cambridge. Tom has a PhD in theoretical physics and um, he will talk a little bit about the imputation of heterogeneous assay data using deep learning. And I have to say, I have heard Tom give talks before and um, I don't think anyone has ever managed to, um, to, to make machine learning and deep learning um, presented in an understandable way to me. So he was the first person and um, this is one of the reasons why I asked him to uh, give a presentation here because I think he's a wonderful presenter and I'm very excited to hear your talk, Tom. Thank you very much, Cathy. Well, not much to live up to there, but uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll manage the, the same today. Um, hopefully you can all see my screen. If you can't, hopefully someone will shout. Um, so yeah, my name's Tom. Uh, I'm the head of machine learning at Intelligence. Uh, as Cathy said, we're a spin-out um, based in Cambridge in the UK, uh, focusing on using machine learning to approach high-value data uh, problems in multiple different domains. But today I'll be focusing on an application uh, in drug discovery using some heterogeneous assay data. So the project that, uh, that I'll be describing very briefly the results of um, was an application of our deep learning technology to some uh, drug discovery data from our collaborator, which in this case was uh, Takeda Oncology based in uh, Boston in the States. And what the aim of this project was to do was to take a large chunk of their corporate collection, uh, so three quarters of a million compounds and over a thousand uh, assay endpoints, and attempt to model this data, effectively come up with uh, a model that would be able to be used internally by Takeda's scientists to predict, uh, is this new compound likely to be active in this endpoint? Or is this existing compound that we've already got, uh, might it uh, be able to be active in a, in a different endpoint that's not yet been measured? 
So this project was broken down into three steps, three stages. Um, we looked at some project optimization. So this was looking at project data sets, project specific data sets, uh, prospectively validating the model. So training on the historic data that have been run in that project, and then uh, making predictions for what we expected to happen in new compounds that were being uh, developed. Uh, and then running that through a couple of times to see how the uh, the application works in a prospective real life manner. Secondly, we were looking at uh, predicting some high throughput screening uh, results. So for example, start from the pilot deck in a high throughput screen and try and predict the activities for the full screening deck. And then the third strand of this project was uh, predicting ADMI properties. Uh, so looking at um, the, yeah, the ADMI properties of a broad range of, uh, of compounds and endpoints. It's about 200 ADMI endpoints we were looking at here. And this last one is the one that I'll focus on for this presentation, just because uh, we've only got a, a short time to talk. I don't want to upload a huge amount of information that we can't get through. Instead, let's try and focus just on this uh, ADMI prediction. Let's say prediction. There are a couple of different things that we do in machine learning to make uh, predictions, to come up with new ideas for uh, numbers that we think might be interesting for a scientist to use. So one of them, the classic one, uh, what we typically mean by prediction, is start from just uh, simple known knowledge. So in drug discovery, that would be the chemical structure uh, and some descriptors extracted from that. And starting just from that uh, really basic starting point, try and predict the uh, properties in a whole variety of different assays. So this is useful for prospective application because when you're looking forwards into the future, trying to evaluate how well a potential new compound might work, uh, the descriptors, the chemical structure is all you know about that compound. And so doing these type of predictions is, uh, is valuable there. But another type of uh, prediction or prediction in, in air quotes that, uh, that can be useful uh, in real life projects is something that we call imputation. So what this imputation means is we start from all of the available information uh, that's in existence about all of the compounds that we know about. So as well as the chemical structure, that's also the uh, experimental measurements that have been run on each of these compounds uh, in any other assays that happen to have been run. And then what we'll try and do is fill in the gaps. So there's no experimentalist in the world that's run every experiment they could possibly imagine on every compound that they're interested in. And in fact, the matrix of compounds versus assays, uh, which is represented by the, uh, the uh, matrix down here on the bottom left of your screen, uh, is mostly empty. Most of those compound assay pairs have not been measured. In drug discovery uh, applications, normally 99, 99.9% .9 of those compound assay uh, pairs have not been measured. And so what imputation enables us to do is leverage that data and fill in the gaps, work out what would have been measured in those assays for those compounds had they actually been run. So how we test these things, um, as we heard in the past talk, uh, how to test and how to validate these methods is, is very important. What we do for this imputation approach um, is we start with a set of given uh, assay results for a set of compounds and train a model upon them. We'll then predict what uh, would have been measured for all of the originally missing data. And then we'll test some of those uh, missing points against a test set that we held out at the beginning. So that test set should be representative of the use case that we're eventually going to use uh, this model for. So in particular, that means it probably shouldn't be randomly held out. Real projects, real drug discovery projects, uh, don't 
progress randomly. Uh, they progress in a very uh, logical and well, hopefully a fairly lo a very logical uh, and driven manner, uh, looking for more active compounds, for example. And so the test set that you test these models on needs to represent that. The alternative, um, if we're doing this prediction type approach, uh, is what we call a virtual model, where we train in the same way, but at test time, uh, we throw away all of the assay data that we uh, might know about these compounds, pretend we don't know anything, uh, fill in all of the gaps, which now is the whole data set, and then test against this, uh, this held back test set. So to show those in action, um, I'm going to show some results against uh, an ADMI test set that we ran uh, with our collaborators, uh, Takeda. And what I'm showing here is a profile of the accuracy on this, on a blind uh, test set of ADMI data. So on the vertical axis, we've got uh, an R squared measure of accuracy. This is the coefficient of determination, uh, which is a very rigorous way of comparing uh, regression uh, predictions to true values. And on the horizontal axis, we've got uh, the 200 odd endpoints ordered by uh, which ones are most accurate. So obviously what we really want uh, is that everything has got an R squared of one, which is perfection uh, across every endpoint. That of course is not actually practical. That's, that's never gonna happen in real life. But what we can do uh, is compare the results of different methods and effectively the methods that are higher up towards the top right hand corner are the most accurate and most reliable. So here I'm showing three different methods. Uh, in orange, we've got a uh, standard random forest off the shelf uh, machine learning approach, which gets reasonable results for some of the assays, but the average, the median average uh, R squared is about 0.2, which is not very reliable and wouldn't really want to be taken forwards to make decisions on. In dark blue then, uh, I've got a virtual model. So this is doing prediction, as I described on a, a slide a couple of slides back, uh, using Intelligence's uh, Alchemite technique. And then in light blue, uh, I've got an imputation version testing against the same data set. And what we can see here is that imputation, because it leverages more information, it uses assay data where it's available at test time to fill in the gaps rather than uh, working blindly off just the chemical structure that enables more accurate predictions uh, on average and in general. We can see there's not a massive difference. Uh, in particular, the uh, virtual prediction and the imputation prediction are pretty similar uh, for most of the endpoints. And this is um, a uh, partly a product of the way this ADMI test set was constructed. As I say, it's got to look realistic, which means it needs to feature um, compounds that have been seen less uh, in the training set, uh, as those are more like the things one would see in real life. We can um, dive down a little bit more into these results though and see a couple of interesting uh, facts. So there were several different types of endpoint, different types of assay had been run in this uh, data set. So on the left, we've got some EC50 endpoints. These are cell-based assays, complex assays. And on the right, we've got some IC50 assays, which are uh, more simple, uh, simple assays, not cell-based. And what we can see is that the imputation and the more complex alchemite approach, uh, more involved alchemite approach, give a higher benefit over the standard off the shelf machine learning uh, in the EC50 more complex data situation. The reason for this uh, is that these cell based assays are a lot more complex than uh, just protein assays. There are a lot more factors that go into the activity of a compound in an EC50. Uh, test. And the imputation approach in particular, because it's been able to learn those relationships directly, 
because it's been able to leverage the information about disparate assays uh, and use it where it's available to help make guide the predictions uh, on a new compound, it's able to do better than a random forest machine learning approach, which isn't able to leverage that information. In contrast for the IC50s, uh, where it's a relatively simple um, structure activity relationship that we're trying to capture, uh, there's less of an advantage to using these other endpoints uh, at the same time. So one other thing it's uh, vital to have to enable reproducible and uh, reliable uh, machine learning results is an understanding of the accuracy and the confidence in each prediction. So what we need is that uh, we're able to identify which predictions are incorrect and throw them away before someone makes a decision based on that prediction. So what our approach does um, is it outputs a confidence interval for each uh, prediction. And what we can do, and the graph on the left here, um, is take uh, effectively order the data points by confidence. So starting on the right with all of the um, predictions, we get a certain level of accuracy. And then we can start discarding those uh, predictions that we're less confident in. There's no point using a prediction if it's wrong. And if we know it might be wrong, we might as well throw it away and uh, just focus on those that, that are, we are confident in and are more likely to be correct. And as the blue line on that graph shows, that's showing that as the uh, fraction of the uh, data set that is predicted is reduced, we're focusing just on the more confident predictions, the deviation between those predictions and the real uh, true values decreases. And so these error bars are an accurate representation of the uh, accuracy of the model. And we can see uh, just in this, as an aside that the horizontal orange bar means that standard random forest predictions uh, are not giving accurate confidence intervals for this data set, uh, which is probably due to the data set distribution, but I'd be happy to go into that. So just to sum up very quickly, um, multi-target imputation and virtual prediction models are outperforming standard uh, machine learning, off-the-shelf machine learning approaches. Imputation in particular utilizes more information and so enables more accurate predictions. And the use of confidence intervals and confidence estimates for each uh, prediction enables you to identify the most accurate values and uh, prioritize experimental resources on the uh, predictions that we're most confident in. We also uh, ran the results for the other data sets I highlighted at the beginning, the project uh, data set, which went very well, High throughput screening didn't go quite as well, probably because the data was, is very noisy, as anyone familiar with high throughput screening will, uh, will attest to. Um, but that's about all I've got time for now, I think. Uh, the full breakdown of these results going into a lot more detail. Um, I'll be giving a webinar, another webinar, uh, in collaboration with Octibrium on the 26th of May. Uh, so I'd hope to see you there if you're interested uh, in any of this. But otherwise, I'd be very happy to take some, uh, some questions now. Okay, thank you very much, Tom, for your talk. And um, I just jump straight in, straight in into the questions. So Manta Singh asks if it's necessary to make a data set of compounds from the same biological assay. Uh, so that's a great question. So one of the things we've looked at uh, in other work um, is whether it's important to make a uh, data set for different uh, chemical spaces or whether we can make one big data set that puts all of the chemical spaces in together, whether doing that you lose any, um, any accuracy. And it turns out that um, using the method that, we've, that I've, I've discussed here today, it is possible to make that one big master model using uh, all the different chemical spaces at once. The reason for that 
is that where these uh, cross assay correlations are available, um, the model will use them, but where they're not available because uh, the particular measurements haven't been taken or there just are no correlations, the model is able to ignore them and so you don't lose anything by building that one big model. Okay, thank you. And then one more quick question um, from Cherry. Do you see benefits in enhancing your data set say by running some or all of the 700,000 compounds through some of the assays, so you have an overall richer data set, would you predict that it would be worth the investment? So that's another brilliant question. Um, so yes, we definitely do see benefit by getting more experimental data. But what we do also see is that it's not just the quantity of the data, but it's where you take it from. So for example, if the model isn't working well in one corner of chemical space, which you're interested in, uh, it makes sense that it's good to go and get more measurements in that part of the space. Similarly, if there's one assay or one family of assays that the model doesn't work very well for, that's the place to get the data from. Um, and our approach is able to spit out uh, which experiment, which compound assay pairs, it thinks would be most valuable to improve the model going forwards and so one thing we've done in in other domains is set up a sort of cycle where we start from the data we do have build a model of it suggest what's the next best experiment to improve that model the collaborator can then run those experiments feed back in retrain the model and uh, repeat the process so that at the end of the day we've got a great model that can make uh, reliable predictions Okay, thank you very much, Tom. Uh, great talk. And you will be around after the official part, so all other burning questions can be asked then later. So we move on in the program now. And um, the next talk will be from Crispin Kiebel. Um, so Crispin works for Atos Bull as a HPC systems architect and um, I think has a background in astrophysics, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, he will talk to us about how you can harness quantum computing power without being a physicist. So, Kristin, please. Thanks very much, Cathy, uh, and good afternoon to you all. Um, yes, uh, my the title is, of this talk is how to harness the power of quantum computing without being a physicist, as you see. I realized um, just when I was re-looking at these slides that I'm promising an awful lot with this uh, with this title. And uh, in the space of 15 minutes, it may be challenging. But what I was hoping to do was to give you an insight into where we are in terms of quantum computing and, and what it might do in the domain of uh, bioinformatics. Um, and then, you know, how it might be possible uh, without being a physicist to um, to get going and, and to start thinking about problems in that, that might be uh, accelerated by quantum computing. So um, I will start then with looking a little bit about what compu quantum computing is um, and what its promises are. And it's really got one key promise, which is uh, represented here. Basically, the idea of quantum computing is that uh, with quantum computers, it'll be possible to solve uh, complex problems much, much faster than is possible on, on anything uh, that's currently available with conventional computing. And um, that is the, that's the, really at the heart of it, massively reduce the complexity. But it, in fact, it's only a certain problems. Um, and uh, that's, a, that's a critical feature, I think, of, of quantum computing. History. Um, quantum computing has was first sort of postulated um, in the early 80s by Richard Feynman, um, and since that time, a lot of work's been done um, on the theoretical side. First of all, uh, and then more late, you know, lately, um, looking at uh, real hardware to develop um, quantum computing machines, and um, we're just beginning to get to a point um, of this so-called NISC, noisy intermediate scale quantum computing uh, devices, where we're kind of on a journey to full scale uh, quantum computers that may be available in 10, 15 years, something like that. But the point in a way, the thing that's, uh, that's interesting is that um, as you begin to see these NISC devices becoming available. Uh, they are devices that are of a scale uh, that might be 
uh, really useful. So they're kind of moving out of uh, the lab or the you know, quantum computing development lab, I should say, um, and into uh, what might be usable, what might be practical uh, to, uh, to deploy on um, actual uh, problems that, that um, people who aren't physicists might have today. Uh, and so that's really quite exciting. That's really, uh, you know, a bit of a, a change in terms of um, what quantum computing can do um, and, and, and how it can do it. So with, with this slide, what, what I'm showing is um, the, um, the speed up that you can see from cl different classes of uh, algorithm. Uh, and what you see is that you know, in, with some um, uh, algorithms, you get a very, very substantial speed up. Shor's algorithm is the classic uh, one there. That's the, that's the algorithm that, that uh, factorizes uh, prime numbers so that uh, you know, maybe the, the internet will be broken by, by quantum computing. Um, Grover's algorithm, also a very excellent speed up. But not all um, app, uh, algorithms uh, speed up with quantum computing computing and that's what you see uh, really uh, tried to represent on, on the right so different uh, an array of different algorithms uh, and the type of speed up that you might expect um, to get from them and you see a, a range of uh, different possible speed ups um, there um, but I think that the, the, the one of the key pieces of this is that a lot of these uh, speed ups that you get from quantum computing are just for the numerical kernel of an algorithm. Uh, and so uh, what we're seeing in, in quantum computing um, is the notion that uh, quantum computers will be an accelerator. Uh, they won't uh, replace classical computing. Uh, they'll just uh, take the heart of um, the, 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 the thing that you're working on uh, and speed that up. Um, and uh, so in a way that's quite similar to HPC systems today, where you know you have a, perhaps a range of um, classical processors uh, and then a range of uh, GPU type accelerators. Uh, you accelerate certain parts of the algorithm with the GPUs. Um, and, and that is something which we expect to see uh, in the quantum era as well, where you have a, a quantum computing processor um, connected to a classical computer um, for just those bits that are um, uh, th th that are uh, available to it. So, what's the, why why are we talking about quantum computing now? Um, in in a time sort of just before, really a few years before these NISC devices are really kind of available in the mainstream. You've, you've probably seen uh, in the news, um, Google has talked about. Um, developing one, but they, they certainly aren't exactly mainstream. You can't go uh, to your local vendor uh, and, and buy um, a quantum computer. Um, the reason really is that quantum computing um, is different from uh, from from programming uh, conventional computers. Uh, the concepts are quite different. The way in which they're programmed is quite different. Uh, and the consequences of that is that, uh, that, that quite a bit of thought, quite a bit of um, uh, reprogramming will need to be done um, into uh, uh, changing the way that uh, uh, our programs uh, behave uh, to, to make, take use of quantum computing. But it's actually worth it because um, it's, it, it, you, they will get such great speed ups that you will, uh, um, uh, in lots and lots of areas, get a huge amount of uh, competitive advantage by, um, by going on to a quantum computer. Just to go over a few of those, um, in terms of health and life sciences, um, chemistry is a, is a sort of um, the kind of classic problem which uh, is susceptible to quantum computing. Uh, it's something which you simply can't do today uh, because the the uh, uh, the time to create an exact solution uh, for um, molecules as they grow bigger um, gets exponentially larger. Um, that is uh, a problem that is uh, tractable on quantum computers. Um, and it's one of the easier areas of uh, deployment on, on a quantum computer. Uh, so it's one where we expect to see um, good uh, speed ups really uh, very soon. So um, moving on, um, in terms of um, pharmaceutical uh, development, uh, protein folding uh, is another area where we expect to see um, a huge speed up uh, in terms of uh, getting the uh, exact 
um, uh, uh, predict for, for protein folding. Um, so again, an area where uh, uh, we expect to see some really big advantages going forward, um, and obviously there are uh, very substantial benefits to be had from that in terms of uh, pharmaceutical uh, uh, development um, and and so forth, as as uh, listed here. Um, there's quite a lot of work going on in uh, machine learning um, with um, exponential speed up in uh, neural network training. Um, so there's also uh, a lot to be uh, a lot to be had. Uh, in this area as well, um, and uh, then a little bit of work that we've been involved in at Atos. So we had a collaboration with with Bayer and Aachen University. Um, that really the what happened was that Bayer came to us and wanted to uh, look at how quantum computing could um, be used um, to. Uh, Deal with uh, real problems. So we met, we formed this consortium to um, to analyse uh, how uh, disease patterns um, might uh, might be uh, uh, assessed um, with uh, quantum computing using quantum computing methods. Um, so we we um, did this work uh, in a in a proof of concept um, where um, what we did was we took the um, the data presented at um, intensive care units um, as people presented uh, with a set of different morbidities. Uh, we used the quantum computed, the quantum computing clustering to try to identify where those morbidities were actually um, clustered. So in other words, associated with each other so that um, you could actually identify um, what might have a common root cause um, in terms of uh, uh, sets of different sets of morbidities um, and uh, then lead to improved uh, diagnostic methods and what we found through this uh, work was um, that we we were able to develop quantum algorithms that were uh, substantially faster than classical algorithms uh, to uh, to do this sorts of sort of work uh, um, and this is all uh, done uh, before uh, quantum computing uh, is really available. Um, so uh, it's, it's quite interesting, really, uh, in terms of uh, showing what, what, will be a, what will be possible um, as quantum computers become available uh, in the next few years. Um, so then uh, looking at uh, what else you might expect to see in terms of timing, uh, what this um, chart shows is is on uh, the x-axis. Uh, you know the length of time that it might take to uh, to get to a point of of, of quantum advantage, um, and on the y-axis uh, how valuable that might be. Um, and so you can you can plot uh, a wide range of different uh, possible uh, algorithms onto a, onto a plot like this. Uh, and as I said uh, earlier on, um, the uh, the chemistry example is uh, you get a, a good benefit from that really quite quickly. Um, um, and the pharmaceutical example uh, might take a little bit longer, but nevertheless, uh, the, the value of it will still be very, very high. Um, and the work that's been going on over the last uh, few years um, has been really exciting in terms of the number of uh, different algorithms and, and, and the ways in which people are beginning to, uh, to, to use quantum computers and to extend uh, their reach. And quite a lot of that is being done through uh, through the work that that, that we have done. So uh, we actually have uh, produced a, a thing called the quantum learning machine. It's uh, it's illustrated here. Um, and what we do is that we put the principles of quantum computing uh, into um, a classical computer, effectively. So quantum computing is is uh, governed by um, the laws of quantum mechanics, uh, which we know, which we understand. Um, and then uh, we can, what we can do on top of that is that we can create uh, what's, what is effectively um, uh, an assembly language of uh, quantum computing. Um, it's a it's a universal assembly language, so 
Um, it's not tied to any one um, particular type of uh, a quantum computer. Um, on the right, you see that there are uh, a range of different uh, technologies that are being uh, thought of in terms of uh, what quantum computers uh, will be deployed. So uh, people like uh, IBM and uh, Google have been working on uh, what are called superconducting quantum computers. Um, those are the ones that go very, very close to absolute zero. Uh, they might turn out to be the ones that um, that are uh, the winners in, in, in the race to effective quantum computing. Um, but an awful lot of work is also being done with uh, trapped ion devices. Uh, and as you see there, Honeywell, uh, Innsbruck and, and others are working in that technology. Um, so it's a bit of a sort of, uh, you know, race to determine which, which uh, a hardware technology will be um, the one that wins in the end. But from the point of view of the QLM, it really doesn't matter because um, we've, what we've done is we've embodied the the, um, the, the fundamentals of, of, of the uh, quantum mechanics into the QLM. And so you can actually uh, use it to uh, uh, program as if you were going to be working on a trapped iron machine or a superconducting machine. Uh, and you can actually uh, do that in a, in a classical computing uh, in, environment. So it's possible to um, uh, create uh, algorithms today or you know, uh, modify um, your uh, uh, wider applications today where you put just the uh, the numerically intensive part into the, the pseudo quantum computer. Um, and then as it becomes available, as the physical hardware becomes available, uh, swap out the QLM and swap in uh, the, the real hardware. So um, we've, we've, we've done this um, with um, a, a system that actually also takes account of noise. Uh, and noise is absolutely critical, or the understanding of noise is absolutely critical um, to the uh, development of, of, of quantum algorithms, because uh, these machines uh, are noisy, and so you have to take account of that. Uh, and that noise might be uh, enough to uh, actually um, destroy the computation. Uh, so you really want to know that ahead of time. You really want to know whether your algorithm is, is proof against uh, the noise that is uh, embodied by, uh, for example, you know, a particular superconducting technology. And you can do that uh, within the context of, uh, of a QLM system. And the thing that's actually quite uh, nice about that, about this system, is that you, um, it, the, the quantum computingness of it is to a degree abstracted away, uh, so that you can actually program it uh, using Python. Um, so really, the uh, the intent is to to make it uh, easier for for people who aren't specialists in the in the domain of quantum computing to um, uh, to, uh, uh, to to work. And one of the things that comes with the QLM is that MyQLM thing, as you see on the left. The MyQLM is is an environment which you can put onto uh, your laptop um, and uh, you know create quantum programs um, on on the laptop. Uh, for smaller, much smaller systems, just to verify that uh, that they work and uh, explore algorithms and that type of thing. So really, the the, the point of the QLM um, is is shown here um, as you know what it's for um, is to is to learn how to do quantum computing, um, and that's a very very cr critical uh, point of it. Um, but then to to do testing, um, you know, just like in in regular software, it's possible to uh, to create um, uh, uh, bugs in your program, or some might say it's difficult to, to do anything otherwise than, other than that. Uh, and so you know, what you want to do is to do testing and understand that the algorithm actually runs, uh, to run uh, a hybrid codes so that you actually uh, can see uh, the, the output of a, of a complete uh, calculation, a complete application. And in fact, the, the bare example that I showed you earlier associated with morbidities is, is exactly one of those. It had a sort of quantum optimization phase uh, followed by um, a, a classical uh, assessment phase. Uh, and then it was, it was cyclic, it went back into the, the quantum uh, um, uh, optimization phase. And the other piece of it is just like in classical computing, uh, you want the, the, the code to be as optimized as uh, you can get it. Um, so there are various different components within the QLM that allow you to optimize code uh, against the, the kind of hardware that you're using, uh, which might be associated with uh, topology, um, or it might be associated with what you can or cannot do on a quantum computer, because uh, that some of them are at a more sort of uh, developed state 
uh, of uh, of being than others, and so uh, not all capabilities are available within within all co uh, quantum computers uh, at this point. So that was a quick canter through uh, quantum computing, and um, if you have any questions, I'd be uh, happy to take them now, um, or you can send me an email at that uh, that email address that you that you see there. Thank you, Crispin. It was a great talk, um, and um, very very great to see that there are already applications in quantum computing. So we had a couple of questions come in. Um, Jonathan asks in relation to the an analogy you mentioned with high performance computing, how soon can we access quantum computing in the cloud? where HPC is now becoming available more widely? Uh, that's a, that's a, a good question. Um, there are already uh, instances of uh, quantum computing available in the cloud today. Um, IBM will uh, give you access to their IBM Q system, which is uh, in, their, in their laboratory. Uh, so it's possible to access quantum computing that way. Um, but we actually also have um, a, a system, a QLM system, uh, which is available at the, the Hartree Center. Um, and that, uh, um, I don't know if you call it the cloud, but it's certainly available um, over over the internet. Um, and uh, so it's possible to, to use the QLM in that way. Uh, it's also possible to use the, the MyQLM system uh, through through access uh, to the, the Hartree Center. Okay, thank you. Then we have another question from John. This is a question that applies to all new technologies, but is there a risk that problems that are tractable drive the questions that get asked? No, I didn't understand that. Could you say it again, please? So it says, is there a risk that problems that are tractable drive the questions that get asked? Uh, well, yes, um, I, I think that's probably true. I mean, I think, you know, in terms of quantum computing, uh, we've gone through a long, long phase of uh, theoretical, of, of theory. Uh, you know, the whole, the, from, from the point at which um, uh, Richard Feynman first sort of postulated the, the notion of quantum computing, um, right until, you know, really the last sort of five, ten years, um, we were exploring the art of the possible, uh, which was very, very theoretical. And so it was kind of out with, uh, you know, w what actual problems uh, people were looking at. And it's only relatively recently that people have, have have seen enough, have, have gained enough confidence, I would say, um, in quantum computers that they've started to look um, at much more uh, closely at what problems uh, should be um, tackled by quantum computers. And so it's really uh, in, the, in this sort of later period, this latter period, where algorithms, you know, the, the, the availability of algorithms has really um, exploded, I would say, um, uh, for uh, quantum computers as, as people are, are beginning to see them as, as real things and and so you know one of the things that um, I, I guess I would also say is that just like with with classical computing um, you know there's a, there's a sort of uh, universal theory of, of um, uh, uh, computing um, the sort of Turing machine idea um, there's also a universal theory of quantum computing um, which uh, has been developed in that sort of theoretical development period uh, and so you can see that um, you know the development of these systems has been done really a little bit independent of what they're being developed for. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you for uh, answering the questions. And um, I think we need to move on to our next talk. So, um, Maria. Maria Garcia is based at the Bioinformatics computing center in Barcelona and um, she's an expert in computational architecture HPC and HPC and um, she will show us the human heart through the eyes of a computer scientist so um, the stage is yours Maria thank you for the introduction and the uh, first thing I want to do is to thank the organizers for making this possible in these difficult times and making it go virtual so yeah, today I'm gonna talk about the heart, the human heart. 
and there uh, are different ways of representing it and i think all of us can still recognize a heart in some of this image but today i want to show you how i can see a heart in an image like this and uh, not only that i hope that at the end of the presentation you're uh, also able to see a bit of the beauty that i see in these kind of images how everything fits together the same kind of beauty that we see in the human heart that uh, it's able to make everything work so first thing i'll present the people that made this work possible uh, i know that this is usual the thing that is done at the end of the presentation but for me it's one of the most important things of this work the the different people that are involved and uh, these are Bea and Alfonso. They are the ones that are able to write these equations that explain how the human heart works. He's Guillaume. He's able to translate those equations to code that can simulate a human heart in a supercomputer. And then it's me. I'm the one that is able to get traces and understand how this works in uh, supercomputing and explain uh, what is going on. So let me talk about the simulation. First of all, we are going to simulate uh, the heartbeat of a human uh, heart. And this simulation includes different physics. On one side, we have the tissue of the heart. Here, there are two kinds of physics salt, the electrophysiology that simulates the electric impulse that keeps our heart beating and the deformation of the tissue due to this impulse. Then on the other side, we have the blood that is filling the cavities of the heart. The blood is in the blood is compute the movement of the fluid due to the deformation of the tissue and also the velocity and the pressure of that fluid experiments due to the deformation. So how we make all this happen, we use a code that is called ALIA. Uh, ALIA is a high performance computing code programmed in Fortran. It works with unstructured meshes and it's parallelized using MPI and OpenMP. We have also two meshes, one that represents the tissue of the heart, it has 500,000 elements, and another one that represents the blood within the cavities of the heart, and it has 400,000 elements. You can find all the details about this simulation, the physical uh, the details, in this article that I referenced here. So once we have, I have everything set up, how I get the traces. So I have Alia running, the meshes, and a supercomputing. I run everything together uh, the same way that a, a scientist will do for their experiments. And with Xtrai, I'm able to get traces. Traces are the files that I were, uh, is keep all the information of what happened during this simulation. Passing these traces through the tools developed at POP, we obtain some, some performance ind indicators. These performance indicators are like the indicators that you get when you go through a blood analysis. They tell me where to look. I don't have a diagnostic yet, but they, I know where I have to look. With the help of Paraver, I'm able to find things and look at what's going on in the traces. When I look at this is when I'm able to make a diagnosis based on what I have found out with Paraver. So here you can see your first trace. In a trace, the x-axis represents the time. The y-axis, each line represents an MPI process. And the color can mean different things. In each trace, you need to know what the color means. In this one, it means which MPI call is being executed. And in gray, it's the computing. So usually when we start um, an analysis, the first thing that we do is to find the interesting part that we want to analyze, what we call the focus of analysis. Usually applications have an initialization, a finalization, and an iterative part in the middle. So if we can find that iterative part, we can focus in two or three uh, iterations. In this trace here, we can see clearly that the, there's an initialization, and then we can see three steps. So we select one of these steps as our focus of analysis to analyze. So, okay, but Marta, where is the heart? So we said that the, to simulate the heart, we have to simulate different physics. 
What I did is I mapped these physics to some colors on the trace. Now, the color represents the physics that is being solved. In blue, you can see the solid mechanics code solving the displacement of the solid. In white, the electrophysiology. In pink, the mesh deformation of the fluid. And in red, the fluid dynamics computing the velocity and the pressure of the blood. The gray color in this case represents when the different MPI processes are waiting for other processes to finish their computation. One of the first things that I do, the first sanity checks that I do when I get a trace, is to check the cycles per microsecond. This is like when you enter a doctor's consultation and one of the first things that they do is to measure the heart rate of the patients. Cycles per microsecond for me is like the heart rate of the application. Usually you expect cycles per microsecond to have a value close to the frequency of the processor where you are running. In this trace, the color in the, the bottom one, the color represents the cycles per microsecond at each moment in time. So we can see that there's something weird happening in this part of the trace marked with the yellow rectangle. If I zoom here, I get this image and we see that if there are some parts of the execution where the value is low. Sorry, I forgot to say that the color here is represented in a gradient value that goes from low values in light green to high values in dark blue. So looking at the code with the developers, we found that they were doing some allocation of large memory regions and initializing them. All the process, all the processes doing this uh, initialization at the same time was what was uh, making these low cycles per microsecond in these regions. So also we find out, looking at the code, that this initialization was not necessary. So we removed that initialization. I obtained uh, again the trace, and this is the second trace without the initialization. We can see that the green parts disappeared and that everything was faster. Now let's look at the performance indicators that I obtained from the POP methodology. In this table, in the different columns, you can see the different number of MPI processes that we use, and the rows are the different indicators. Red color means that this is a limiting factor for this number of cores. Green means that you have a good efficiency, and yellow means that this can become a limiting factor when you try to scale to a higher number of cores. What I see here is that we have a very low parallel efficiency. Getting a 33 here means that only 33% of the time is used to actually do computation. The other time is waste due to the parallelization. I see also that there is a huge load imbalance. 40% 40, uh, 40 of the time is lost waiting to, for other processes that are more loaded. And I also see that we have a big serialization problem. Now that the performance indicators have told me where to look, I can open a trace and look for the imbalance. We can see that the tissue processes that are the top ones in blue are more loaded than the bottom ones. They have more work to do. And they are making all this time, the, um, the blood processes are waiting. Also, about the serialization, we can see this pong, ping pong pattern here, where they are, some of them are working and the others are waiting. This is a typical source of serialization inefficiency. This happens because the fluid must wait for the tissue deformation to finish to know how to compute the deformation of the fluid. And at the same time, the solid must wait for the pressure of the fluid to know how it affects the deformation of the solid. So now that I have looked at the traces, I have the diagnostic. The diagnostic says that the main problem is the serialization because the physics must wait for the other physics to be solved. This is a common issue in fluid structure interaction problems. Our recommendation to solve this is to allow processes to share resources, but in a smart way. We explain it how to do it in this article here. Uh, and uh, the other big problem is load balance, because the processes solving the tissue are more loaded than the processes solving the blood. Our recommendation to address this problem would be maybe to rest distribute the resources, for example, giving more processes to the tissue than to the fluid. Now, I 
let's look at, look at the efficiency metric, metrics obtained just by, for the tissue. I applied the same methodology, but only for the yellow rectangle marked here. So only for the processes that are uh, solving the tissue part. What we see now that is that the indicators are much better. The only the indicator with a low value is load balance. If we analyze the trace, I zoom here in the part that we are analyzing, and I get this image here, that's a zoom, and here I can see the MPI calls. Gray in this, in this case is computing, and color is that they are waiting in an MPI call. We can see that there's a huge load imbalance. Some processes have twice the work than others. And uh, after checking with the developers and analyzing also the partition of the mesh that we can, you can see here, the summary of the partition, how the heart was partitioned, we conclude that the difference can come from the fact that there are different kinds of materials involved in the tissue of the herd, and the simulation and the computation cost of these materials is different. That's what is giving the load imbalance in the computation. So, or the diagnostic is that the main pre, pre, uh, problem for the tissue is the load balance. And this is related to the nature of the problem because a different kind of materials have different computational costs. To address this, we suggest to try to partition the mesh based in the kind of material of the elements, if possible, or to use a dynamic load balancing mechanism that you can find more details in other words that we have done uh, in this article here. Now I obtain the same performance indicators for blood that in this yellow rectangle that you see here. We, we can see that almost all of them are in green except for the transfer efficiency. Almost 50% of the time is lost in communication, but load balance and serialization have good values. This means that the time spent in communication is not waiting or synchronizing, is really doing communication. So let's analyze in detail the traces. I zoom in the part of the trace that we are analyzing and I get this uh, in the MPI calls. We see a small part in gray, that is the part that is computing, and a lot of part in colors, that is the part that is communicating. So what I did is I measured the number of MPI calls of each type executed, and I find out that there is a very high number of point-to-point -point calls. Also, there is a high imbalance in the number of calls made by the different MPI processes, and that the transfer comes from having a high number of calls more than the amount of data exchanged. My conclusions for the blood is that the main problem it faces is the transfer due to the high number of MPI calls uh, in special the MPI point-to-point -point calls. My suggestion is to improve this, uh, to try to re reduce the number of point-to-point uh, -point calls, maybe grouping them or to send sending several values with the same call, or maybe doing a partition with less neighbors when partitioning in the domain. So to finish, I want to highlight the two most important things that uh, the things that I found with this work is, on one hand, the interdisciplinary work to be able to work with the developers who really, uh, and scientists who use these simulations. I think it enriches uh, my work and I hope that uh, they feel the same about mine. I think it, uh, for me, it's very interesting to know what I'm doing. So I, I, of course I can do an analysis of a trace and I don't know what is that, but it's more fun and more interesting to know what I'm simulating and understand really what's going on there. And also about the performance analysis. I think performance analysis must be done and uh, it's very useful to not only to improve the performance of your application, but also to find bugs, to find conf different configuration problems and to understand what your application is, how, how it's working. All this, uh, it's done in the context of POP, that is a center of excellence uh, where we offer a service, different services. Uh, one of them is to analyze your application. Any user or developer from Europe can ask for an analysis of their application. 
you just need to fill the form that uh, there's a, here or you can also uh, email me and ask me about that and thank you for letting me present if you have any questions I, i'll try to stay until the end but Thank you very much, Marta. That was a very interesting talk. Um, so let's see if you have a couple of questions. So, um, I mean, of course, you've presented the data on the heart, but this can, of course, be used for other organs as well, right? Right. We are working also in uh, so other organs or other things. I mean, I have analyzed an airplane, or and uh, the last one is the the spine. So how how um, medicine uh, it flows through the spine, the human spine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, let me see what else we have. Um, yeah, I think that's it for now. Um, if there are any more questions, please let them come in through the question box. So actually, there is a quest another question. Yeah, um, and has it been discussed? Has pop been discussed in any of the Elixir communities? Are you aware of that? Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure. Uh, so I also presented uh, in an event where there were Elixir was involved, but I don't know if if it's uh, it has been discussed one to one. So. Uh, I think it may be interesting. Okay. So, do you also liaise um, with clinicians around your work, or is that too far removed at the moment from what you do? Yeah, they are quite. So, I have in the middle. I have the developers of the um, the scientists that work with the application, and they are the ones that work with the doctors and uh, with and discuss with them. So, I'm kind of far from, but just one half one hop from them okay well then thank you very much for your presentation and um, we move on our next speaker is um is charlotte dean charlotte is the head of stati of the statistics department at the university of oxford and um she will tell us a bit more about machine learning approaches to identify a predicted protein structure in the correct fold. Um, yeah, please, Charlotte. So I thought I should start by explaining why it still matters in the era of AlphaFold, which I presume most people have heard of, um, to actually think about whether you're predicting the correct structure. Because, you know, for those of you who didn't hear about it, AlphaFold did a very good job of predicting the shapes at the kind of um, comparative assessment of protein structure prediction. So it put out the idea that we had kind of solved this problem. And I think, first of all, I'd like to say we haven't solved this problem, but we have made some big steps towards solving it. There we go. So I'm not going to talk about how AlphaFold works. That's a pretty picture of it on the left. Really, I'm going to talk a little bit about what you see on the right and that you look at the kind of pretty folding um, happening on the left-hand side now. AlphaFold um, did better than any other method at the prediction of protein structure. So you can see on this graph, a perfect prediction would have achieved a score of 100 for all of the things. So the first thing to note is, we're doing better, but we're still a long way off having structures that might be considered to be very useful in terms of pharmaceutical development, for example. A lot of the predictions we're making are still not that great, but it did do a lot better than anything else at the CASP13 um, competition. So why am I so interested still in thinking about ways of getting the best models out of these things? And really the answer is on this slide. Finding the good models is still quite a big problem. So on these graphs, a perfectly performing method would have a line which ran along the x-axis completely flat, because that would mean 100% of all residues were within zero of where they should be, so they're exactly where they should be. Now, the issues we have are twofold. If I look at the picture on the left first, you can see that AlphaFold did pretty well. It made a set, five of it, those are its five models that it put in, and they're all pretty good. But it didn't tell you which one of those was the best. 
and there's still quite a big difference between its very best model and its worst model there in terms of whether you might want to use it for say docking small molecules into you'd want to know which one you've got and then if I go to the example on the right in this case alpha fold so that's the blue lines again it didn't produce any good models yep but the problem for you as a user is in both these cases you get the same result which is alpha fold gave you a model what would you do with it because it might be really good like the ones on the left or it might be not very good at all like the one on the right now i'm just using alpha fold as an example here this problem is true for all of the software in this realm where what we do is the programs are trained to produce models so they produce models and the question needs to be asked whether you should use that model going forward in the types of work you want to do so very simply we wanted to set something up which was answered these questions can we identify a good model and determine whether it's correct so we made a sort of decision on what we thought was usability which is using a particular way of scoring so better than 0.5 on a value called the tm score but it doesn't actually matter what we choose for that you can choose your own categorization using the same techniques because we want to know when we have a model we could use for future work so when will this actually be useful and we want to find the best possible model so that's the second stage of this given that i can identify i've got a good model could i find the best one that i have made and then the second part of this, which I thought was quite important, is actually it's computationally very costly to do protein structure prediction now because you want to build lots and lots of decoys. You want to run your code many times. And particularly if you want to do it for many, many targets, it starts to be one of these things where you want a big supercomputer or you want to make use of the kinds of computers we hope are coming, like quantum computers, to speed this all up. So could we reduce that burden? So if I could, say, run my software for a while and check out, do I think I've already got a good model, in which case I'll stop? Or do I need to keep going till I find a good model in my set? Is it possible to write code that can actually help you achieve that? The software we're going to use for producing the protein structures here is one that um, we wrote in our group, which is called Saint2. I'll show you later that this works across all different types, but just this is what we were using to produce potential predictions of protein structures. And the difference between this and pretty much all the other software out there is it's biologically inspired. And the most important part of that is it works in the same way that proteins actually fold themselves. So we start with a small piece of protein structure and we extrude. So we make the protein longer through time. And as we do that, we make moves to continuously update the structure. So you can imagine this is almost emulating folding, except we're gonna do it with fragments and we're using a Monte Carlo way to do that. And our standard way of doing this, we would generate say 10,000 models and then try and select from them the correct model. What I'm actually gonna use through the rest of this presentation most of the time is only generating 500 models, because once again, if you want to do 500 or 1,000 test cases and you want to generate 10,000 models, you need very big computers to think about that. So we're starting to think, how can you produce less models and how can you know you've done well when you have produced less models? And first issue to touch on here, and I think it's really important, it's proved to be incredibly important in this field and something we saw was not always handled well, and it relates a lot to things other speakers have mentioned, is this issue about thinking about your training and your validation and how you do this. So what I'm showing you here are our training and validation sets, and I've actually just split them into three categories based on something called Be Effective. Be effective is actually really the number of homologous sequences you have for a given um, protein. And it's a pretty good indicator because of the way the scoring functions are generated for protein structure prediction of whether you'll get a good answer or not. So you can see here what we've done is we've balanced in terms of this um, be effective, the number of um, targets we have in training and validation of each type because if we trained with a balanced set and then validated with things which all had to be effective over a thousand we would think we were really good at doing this because it's pretty easy to get good answers when you're up there 70 percent of everything you generate there will have a good answer to go and find whereas if you look at things with be effective less than 100 it's quite rare to get a good answer there the same things can be seen if you look at the fold class of the protein. So if you split by it being an alpha protein, a beta protein, and the same things by length. So these concepts of thinking very carefully about how you are training and how you're validating and the balance between these sets, I think stretches across all of the different problems people work with in machine learning. Now there are lots, well, there are many other programs out there which attempt to rank models. And what we started with obviously is 
effectively looking at what everyone else had done. So in our 244 cases in our training set, it turns out that within 500 decoys generated by Saint 2 there's 151 where there is something we would call a correct model. So we've got a large number of cases where we never produce anything good, and that's pretty standard in this kind of world. So that's kind of what we'd expect. And so best case scenario would be a program that in 151 cases, its number one ranked thing would be the right answer. But I would also like it to tell me that the others are incorrect. Now, the first thing to look at is these are the kind of current scoring functions for doing this. And we, you notice that at the top end of this, for example, is our Saint2 function. Now that makes sense because that's the function that goes with our program. So if it didn't do well at ranking with our program, I'd be a bit sad. You can also see some things in there like Eigenthreader. These are using the contact maps as a kind of um, fold prediction um, way of doing the evaluation and have not been used in this way before. And it turns out they're very, very effective. Now, the reason we thought it was worth thinking about whether we could build a better model for doing this was if you look at the consensus bar here. Now, this is cheating because I've taken the top answer from everybody and now I can get 121 correct. But obviously that's cheating because I now have lots and lots of potential top ones. But what it's telling me is that these functions don't all give me the same answers. So if I could combine them correctly, potentially I could do better than any individual. So we built something called RFQA model for doing this model quality assessment. So it, we tested actually many different types of architectures and it turned out for this problem, a random forest is a very good classifier. And we get it to output a score, the model is correct. So it has a TM score greater than 0.5. But once again, you could set that how you wish. It features, well, that's basically the set of features I've just shown you, those methods for doing quality assessment and the contact map alignment scores. And we also used ensemble descriptors and that's important because they will change as we add or create more decoys. So we would, if we had 500 decoys, it will look quite different from if we had 10,000. And then we rank the models in terms of how we think. And we trained it on these two non-overlapping sets. So first of all, does it work? Well, the answer to that question happily is yes. And here I'm just looking at the highest ranking model per target. And I'm seeing how well I do in terms of true positive and false positive rate. And I'm happy because my red line for my method is above all the others. I would hope that it would be given that it, it's based on the others. So it should be able to do better. And we're seeing that. What's perhaps more interesting is what's shown here. And this is a little bit difficult to interpret, but I will do my best to explain what you're looking at. So if we look at the right hand side of this, this is the score given by our FQA model and for the top model and then the TM score of that top model. So how good it is. So how closer to one better model um, on the Y axis. And then on the left hand side plot, this is for one of the other very top methods for doing this, which is a combination of a whole set of scores. Now, what happens here, and it's quite interesting, is not only is our FQA model actually, it can offer you a much higher precision um, with a, a much better recall, but what it can also do is when I don't have very many models, I'm still able to identify good models. And that's quite important because what that means is maybe if I've only generated 10 decoys, I already know I've got something good. Whereas all of the other measures seem to rely on us having already generated 10,000 to be able to work out whether we have a good answer at all. This slide is just to show you what can be done here as well. So we had a look at just using our model and this was completely trained on our Saint 2 data, which is a particular way of building um, free models on all of the data available from CASP 13 on the 34 free modeling targets. And what we found interesting about this is, of course, we were training using only one type of program, which probably doesn't build similar models to everything else. And we are still performing in an overall sense, if you look at the graph on the left, slightly better than everyone else at identifying correct models and good models. And, you know, I would say in the pack of the top performers, these are the top four performing methods from CASP. Um, in terms of identifying the very best model that you can get. So just to get to that last point about being able to use your computation more efficiently, this is just one particular example. 
So the little red dot on the left hand side here is after we had built 500 models. The model we would have selected had a TM score of about 0.4 and we didn't really like it. We associated it with low confidence to say it was a good model, which is correct because it was not a good model. What happens as we build more models is now we, if we go to the bit that where it's kind of changed to a sort of yucky yellow green color, yeah, as we build more models and we're looking here each time, you can see that we're getting things that are actually above 0.5 and maybe reasonable models. Um, and we now associate them with medium confidence. And as we generate more and more models, we get to a point where we now have high confidence that we have a good model. And interestingly, that is also at the point where we actually see a really quite a good improvement in the quality of the model. So in this particular case, if we waited until we got to the high confidence point, we would produce a very good model and be able to select it out. And we would have been able to do that without bothering to build 10,000 models of this structure. We've run this on lots of cases and in different cases, it has different implications. And the interesting thing about this, of course, is it means you can concentrate your computation where it is needed on the cases where you do need to run for much longer in order to find good answers. So very quick summary of all of this. Um, I've managed to start all of them with the name of the program, which is always a good place to go. It's able to classify whether your models are correct or incorrect. And I should say that all the code is up and available for people to download, but also for you to change the parameters of how it is trained. So you might want to make a choice that you're looking for much better models than we chose here, because that might be more useful in your way of looking at things. Or maybe you don't care if they're that good and you want to tune that down. It incorporates everything that's currently existing. And obviously, you could incorporate more scores into it if it was felt that would improve it. The interesting parts of this is the last two, where I think that you could use this in very powerful ways to determine when you need to stop doing work, because actually that frees up computation for doing it when it is more complex. So just to finish off, I should finish off by thanking the people who actually did the work. So first of all, I should thank the list across the bottom here, um, who are the different groups that fund the research within my group. And in particular, I should thank Claire West, who did most of the work I've just talked about. And it was in collaboration with UCB and also with a collaborator from um, Stanford. Um, I've put the paper up there, but also on our website is all the code and everything else in case you're interested in any of it. And thank you very much. OK, thank you very much. Um, and so we have a couple of questions coming in. One of them is, given that AlphaFold is the leading method in solving the protein folding problem, why haven't you compared your model results with those from AlphaFold? And how do you plan to be better than AlphaFold? From so, I think there, I think, so I think there are several pieces to that. First of all, until relatively recently, AlphaFold didn't release their code. They still have not released their code in such a way that you can actually um, fully implement it. Uh, they've missed out some sections, um, if ever, anyone else has tried to play with it as well. The second part of this is that we can show that we can select from the AlphaFold models that are given to CAS better than AlphaFold itself can. So really, this isn't about improving the structure prediction. We used our own tool for doing structure prediction because that's easier to control and we can control all the variables. I don't have any objection to using AlphaFold to do that. But this is about selecting from the set that you have generated. So do you know when AlphaFold has built a good model and what is the best model that it has built? And I should also say that I think there are now some academic groups who argue that they're doing better than AlphaFold, but I'm not going to get into that argument. I think that it is still showing the way in terms of how we need to do these things. OK, thank you. And then um, in terms of protein folding, you know, can you predict certain protein classes or certain proteins better than others? Does this have to do with size or complexity? And um, yeah. So yes, you definitely can. The first part is size. So um, pretty much none of these programs, and that is AlphaFold included, really get beyond the kind of 200 to 250 residue proteins, which given that average human proteins were up at 300 is still very short. That doesn't mean they never make a good prediction beyond that length, but they're much, much more effective on shorter proteins. The other area that makes them much more effective is the amount of alpha helical content in the protein. 
because mm -hmm. alpha helices are basically easier to predict and they are also, if you like, more reproducible between every protein we have ever seen. An alpha helix looks like an alpha helix looks like an alpha helix, whereas knowing that something's a beta strand, there are many, many more variants of what that might look like, and that seems to cause the programs a great deal more difficulty. And I also think it's the long interaction, so the sort of long in sequence based interactions between the beta strand proteins that cause further problems as well. Okay, so we take one more question, and um, that's from Dave Curtin. How do you differentiate between a good model versus the best model? So effectively, we've got two different um, scoring systems. I was trying to be as quick as possible through here. So we score to identify if we have a good model. So over a certain confidence threshold, which is 0.5 for us, because that's what makes sense. Um, we say we're confident that the model you're looking at is a good model, so it has the right fold. The second question is um, you're actually really attempting to predict the very highest or best TM score or whatever metric you want to use model in the set. And so then you pick the highest probability model that you've got. And once again, that's just a, a question of how you set up your training in terms of doing that. OK, thank you very much, Charlotte. And um, yeah, great talk. And let's move on to our final presenter. Okay, yeah. so um, <laughs> I'm not the final presenter, but it, it's my delight to introduce Alex Wade, who is. Um, he started his career in academia at the University of Washington and then moved to industry working for Microsoft for over 17 years and, and became director of scholarly communications there. Uh, he now works for the Chad Zuckerberg Initiative uh, around supporting open software for science, and I know some of the Elixir folks have uh, applied for some of that uh, funding calls, and also involved in the Meta project using machine learning to map the latest biomedical research in real time. And um, his talk is um, around essential open source software for science. So away you go, Alex. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um... Uh, so starting as others have, uh, can people see my screen? <laughs> the slide's visible. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. I can see your okay. slides. Excellent. And my dual screen as well. Get that up so thank you very much. So yes, I am here with the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, and uh, I'm glad to hear that, that people have applied for our essential open source uh, software for science RFA. I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but to provide some, some context, first of all, one of the uh, primary aims of the science portion of the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative is, is really to uh, support the science and technology that will enable us to cure, prevent, and manage all diseases by the end of the century. And that's sort of dealing with an, an 80 year time frame. Um, one of the things that, that became apparent to us as we started up this, this organization a couple of years ago and started working with a small number of, of subdomains within biomedical sciences is that um, there were some cross-cutting issues that, that, were, uh, that were coming out. And so we formulated another program within the Science Initiative, the Open Science Program that I'm a part of right now, really aimed at, at developing uh, new tools and technologies and supporting more open collaborative models of research. And we're really hoping that we can use this uh, over the, the nearer term to jumpstart some of the, the longer term goals of the organization's organization. We think about this in sort of four ways. One of them is to support the, the platforms that enable the rapid sharing of scientific outputs. Uh, secondly, to remove barriers to knowledge discovery. Uh, a third area that, that really uh, became evident to us early on um, is that the the, the pipeline that, uh, of, of people performing the science didn't necessarily bring them up to speed with the latest uh, uh, computational needs that they would have. And so we really have a strong uh, focus that we're trying to, to pay more attention to right now in developing computational capacity. And then finally is to support and reward the people that are developing, sharing, and reusing the, uh, the essential open source tools that are powering a lot of the, the biomedical research that's going on today. This talk will focus mostly on the last one in this essential open source software for science program, but I wanted to give you a really quick overview of some of the other efforts just to put this all into context. So in the area of preprints, preprints have been around uh, in the 
physical sciences and computer science uh, for a long time. Or actually, in biomedical sciences, were some early interesting uh, efforts going back to the 60s in, in sharing biomedical preprints, but they, they never seemed to catch on for a variety of reasons. Um, but this chart really shows over the last six or seven years uh, that, that, bio, uh, that preprints in biomedicine really have started to take off. Um, we have been supporting for the past few years bioarchives out of Cold Spring Harbor, uh, but there's obviously a number of others that, that are also accelerating right now. Um, this is sort of a great growth chart for looking at, at how preprints are taking off in biomedicine, but this still really only accounts for uh, you know, roughly 4% of the publications that are going into PubMed uh, every year. So it's growing, but it's still relatively small. Um, we'd like to see more of this, especially right now in the, in the current climate of COVID-19. Uh, so if you go back and look at some of the, uh, the previous um, epidemic outbreaks in, in the past decade, two decades with you know, Ebola and Zika, um, we're really seeing a very, very small number of preprints relative to peer, peer reviewed publications that were sort of mapping as these uh, epidemics were, were spreading. Uh, it, by comparison, if you look at the chart uh, over on the right here, you can really see that in terms of uh, volume, that, that really the community has started to rally around preprints as a way of rapidly sharing this information. So it's, it's, it's encouraging in that respect. Um, pivoting off, off of that a little bit is, is an effort that uh, a couple of my colleagues and I have been involved in in taking a lot of the published, uh, peer-reviewed published publications as well as preprints um, and making them openly available through a, an effort called the COVID-19 Open Research Dataset. Uh, this was something that was uh, prompted by the White House OSTP, uh, led by a, a colleague, former colleague of mine at Georgetown University's uh, CSET and involved us and the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence uh, Microsoft Research and Google uh, to make this data set available. Um, this effort started up about five weeks ago. Uh, four weeks ago, we released the, the first data set uh, in middle of March, and we've been updating this uh, roughly weekly since then. So the last uh, update of this went out uh, Friday of last week, and it has uh, approximately 57,000 metadata records, including 45,000 full text records covering not just uh, COVID-19, but the, the entire uh, coronavirus family, including SARS and MERS. Um, so this is something that um, we attempted to do to make it much easier for the machine learning AI community, especially people working in natural language processing, to have a uniformly um, uh, formatted, effectively, uh, collection of machine-readable content. Uh, we started with a, a small corpus of about 1,500 file, uh, 1,500 publications that had been identified by the World Health Organization. Um, we mined everything out of uh, PubMed Central that was relevant, and then working with Cold Spring Harbor, we brought in all of the relevant bioarchive and medarchive preprints into this. Semantic Scholar from Allen AI acted as the hub of this effort, and we took what was mostly PDF files. Um, but ran them through a PDF text conversion uh, application to both synchronize the metadata around them as well as the full text. So this created a, a single unified collection of, uh, like I said, about 45,000 uh, JSON records uh, that are available in a couple of places right now. Uh, you can get to them from the Semantic Scholar website uh, at Allen AI. And then we've also got a port of that that goes over to a Kaggle website the Kaggle website is probably an interesting place to start if anybody wants to look at this. Uh, there's a number of challenge questions that were initially seeded by the World Health Organization. And there's a great sort of community that's, uh, that's going on right there where people are sharing uh, their, their notebooks, sharing uh, derivative data sets, adding in new data sets around that as well. So this all sort of fits under the umbrella of our open science program. Um, we've also been supporting some other efforts for, for making protocols open and shareable and citable uh, through organizations like protocols.io. And one of the things that I think makes the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative unique among philanthropic organizations is that in addition to being a funding organization, we also have a very large technology team in-house. 
And one of the things that the, the tech team has been working on here and making openly available is an application called Meta. Uh, if anybody is interested, I encourage you to, to log into meta.org and play around with it. Uh, but the, the general idea is to create a, a current awareness tool that is uh, scanning all of the current literature, preprints as well as published literature, and enables you to create feeds of the sort of real-time publications in areas that are of interest to you. And then finally, as I mentioned earlier, um, the uh, this need for, for increased support for computational capacity amongst biomedical researchers is something that we're currently supporting through efforts like the Carbon Police. Now, pivoting on to the, to the main thrust of this and, and supporting the invisible foundations of science, uh, it was about a year ago that this image emerged. And if anybody can recognize it, it was a major scientific breakthrough when it was the first ever produced image of a black hole. And uh, this fiery donut fo uh, photo um, was an incredible achievement. It had taken many years. It had taken roughly 350 astronomers, engineers, and data scientists to produce this image, working from the raw data that's coming down from a number of, of different observatories and sensors. But what the image here doesn't really capture is how much more invisible labor went into its creation. Uh, Dr. Katie Bauman uh, was giving a keynote address uh, shortly after the re release of this image. And she noted that more than 20,000 people had participated in the creation of much of the open source software that made this breakthrough image possible. Yet most of that open source software never had received any dedicated funding or any maintenance. Uh, just to pick one of those uh, applications that was used in, in the generation of this image was Matplotlib. And it's a Python library. I'm sure many of you have used it. Um, but it's sort of emblematic of the challenges that have been faced by many open source software packages that are essential to modern science. This package alone is named as a dependent for roughly 190,000 other software packages. And if you think about that in the context of, of what counts in science today, which is citations to, uh, to my publication, uh, if, if a dependency in a software package was the equivalent of a, of a software citation, Matplotlib would, would be viewed as one of the most highly impactful uh, publications. But they don't. This isn't, this isn't the way that scientific credit works. So as I mentioned before, one of the key tenets of our, our vision for open science here at CCI is to support and to reward the creators and maintainers of these resources, especially those that support the open, collaborative, and, uh, and reproducible approaches to research. And that includes code, data, methods, preprints, et cetera. And so one of the things that we've been working on doing is to, to figure out how to make these efforts, this labor, more visible uh, more findable or fundable, I should say, uh, and more recognized. So uh, about a year ago, we announced the, uh, the Essential Open Source Software for Science program. It is something that uh, was initially focused on some of the other areas that CCI was already invested in, um, but we made the awards within the program relatively modest. Uh, the funding request can be anywhere between 50,000 and 250,000. They are one year grants. Um, and we spread this out over three funding cycles. The second funding cycle, uh, the application period ended in December. And I was really hopeful when I committed to giving this talk today that I'd be able to announce the awardees for the second cycle. Um, we have them ready to go, but it's probably going to be a couple weeks from now or early May sometime before we're able to make that announcement. Um, I'm, like I said before, I'm glad to hear that, that folks on the call may have applied. Uh, we do have one more round of funding for this year coming up, and we expect to open this by mid to late June uh, this year, so just a couple months from now. The purpose of the loan, uh, well, the purpose of the grant was not to uh, to necessarily drive new features and functionality within these software packages, but was really to support a variety of things that are often uh, sort of neglected, uh, underfunded, given, given short trip. Um, people have applied for resources to support documentation, 
uh, to support more usability studies, uh, to bring in project managers, or to support community engagement, for example. And we also uh, 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 encourage applicants to uh, join together, multiple open source projects coming together for a single application where they may want to support uh, interoperability between two packages or where there might be two competing software packages to rationalize them and join those things together. So I wish I could give you some, some statistics about the, uh, the second round, but as I said, we can't really release that until, until we've made the announcement. But let me give you a sense from the first round of, of applicants that we uh, announced back in November. In the first round, we got just under 300 applications. And since each application can represent multiple open source projects, those 300 applications represented roughly 475 open source projects. The bulk of those were projects hosted on GitHub, um, very strong representation, especially from Python and R. Uh, the vast majority of them came from academic organizations, but we also had good representation from industry and nonprofits. And it was globally distributed, but I would say it was heavily skewed to US and, and then Europe, probably speaking. Um, don't read too much into this slide. The, the sort of categorization was done by us, uh, more or less uh, ad hoc. Um, but we, we tended to sort of cluster the applications uh, along these fields. Um, this does give you a sense of, of what change, changes happen from round one to round two. Uh, you can see, for example, that 10% of the applications in round one were around imaging and microscopy. Um, that jumped up to about 18% of the applications in round two. And you know, to pick another one, uh, the last one there, data management workflow packages uh, was about 17% of the overall applications in the first round, and that dropped down to about 13% in the second round. So some of the things that we've learned uh, through this process, uh, first of all, it was well received. <laughs> uh, the, the community uh, appreciated it. Um, there's also been a lot of interest by other funding organizations um, who are uh, curious to see what evaluation metrics we used uh, uh, around how we manage the program. Um, so we are really trying to bring together more funders into this effort. We, we hope that we're not the lone uh, philanthropic organization who's paying attention to this stuff. Um, we had some, some additional sort of, uh, you know, reaction here as well. One of, one of the, uh, the uh, Imaging Software Fellows, one of our other CGI programs, wrote a, a really nice blog piece on what he felt that this uh, essential open source software for science program meant for the, the open source software community. Uh, Nature picked this up and also wrote about it, but he mentioned that uh, supporting, supporting the maintenance rather than the development of hot new things was really a sort of critical feature of this. And, and that's, that's really something that we have seen where uh, open source software packages may get an initial burst of funding as part of other funding, but then once it, it sort of goes past that initial development phase, it is, as it becomes more and more useful for the community is when it gets less and less funding attention to it. And that's what we're trying to address here. So del delving a little bit into the evaluation criteria of the applications, um, really we look at uh, uh, about four different dimensions. One of them is, is the impact. Um, so as I mentioned with something like Matplotlib, it's something that is, is uh, a dependency for other programs. We look at uh, how often it has been downloaded, how often it's been forked, um, how, how big uh, is, the, uh, is the, the sort of spread of the software package, you know, especially if you use analogy like, like citations. Um, we also look very heavily at the, at the quality of the project. And, and one interesting analysis that we did with an organization called Chaos was to delve deeper. Th this table over here on the right was not a table that we used as part of the evaluation criteria, um, but this was a post hoc analysis of comparing the, the set of applications that we received versus the ones that we funded. And so some interesting things you know, emerged from that. 90% of the applications that uh, the projects were, that were in the applications that we received had documentation. Um, but of the ones that we funded, 100% of them did. Um, code of conduct, to pick the, the bottom one on the list, 46% of the applied 
uh, applied and eligible projects have a stated code of conduct for the communities, um, much higher percentage of the ones that we funded did. And these can all be sort of viewed as indicators perhaps of, of the maturity of the project as well. Um, we also looked at the feasibility of the project. And this is sort of an interesting when you go back to the uh, to the comments that the, the one recipient had received around not just funding the hot new things. We, we got an interesting distribution of, um, on the one hand, people who are just saying, you know, I really need funding to, to spend six months getting this thing documented or to clean up uh, this aspect of it or to build a better uh, issue tracker and, and community involvement. Really some of the, you know, the nuts, nuts and bolts of managing an open source community. And on the other hand, people were, had very sort of ambitious uh, goals, you know, more along those lines of there's been this great feature that we wanted to work on for a long time. We want funding so we can focus some attention or bring in some additional developer uh, resources to work on that. So sort of evaluating what the uh, what the funding proposal was, what the timelines were um, against the feasibility backdrop was one of the interesting challenges that we had in this, in this process. And then we also looked at, uh, at diversity. Um, this was not really an evaluation criteria, but it's something that's been very uh, uh, important to us to think about. In the first round of the EOSS grant, we had an optional diversity statement, and we had about 60% of the applications uh, submit a diversity statement. Many of those diversity statements, uh, because we could see when they posted them to GitHub, um, happened to come in very close to the time when they actually submitted their applications, uh, indicative perhaps of the fact that they didn't have a diversity statement and they created one just in time to get their application in. But in the second round, uh, we actually made that diversity statement required. And that's something that we're now starting to expand to the rest of CZI's uh, RFA process. Um, and then the second thing that we did uh, to this bullet point, second bullet point down at the bottom, is um, we actually uh, asked for optionally uh, some, some demographics, especially gender, of not only the applicant, but of the, the key personnel on the project in EOS S2, round two. Uh, this wasn't uh, anything that we used as part of the decision criteria, uh, but it's, it was important for us to start understanding. Uh, we, we recognize fully that the, uh, that, that the software industry in general, and especially in you know, a lot of the fields that we're funding, has traditionally been uh, significantly skewed towards men. Um, we wanted to see you know, how, how the community that we were attracting uh, through the applications and ultimately funding uh, represented that. And so uh, stay tuned for, for more information on this because I, I, we've got some, some very uh, positive results coming out of the second round. So as I said, I, I really wish that this slide was, uh, was the the reveal of who we're funding in EOSS round two, but just to give you an idea of some of the packages that we were supporting in round one, um, some, some very recognizable names here, I'm, I'm sure. And then one of the other uh, sort of nice benefits, I think, of this program is not just trying to support these open source packages, but actually to bring this community together to learn from each other uh, to encourage further collaboration between these funded projects. So back a long, long time ago, uh, I think it was like two months ago, February 20, 25th through 27th, back in an era where people were allowed to, to gather together in the same room, uh, we brought together uh, these fund these funded projects um, here in Berkeley, a couple blocks from where I'm sitting right now, uh, for a, a three-day workshop uh, really to uh, share their projects, share, share their pain points, uh, talk about some common needs across them. Uh, and this is something that we uh, intend to fold into future rounds and grow this larger community uh, of open source software development uh, uh, engineers in a way that, that benefits all of them, hopefully. So Coming up real soon, as I've alluded to, uh, we will be uh, making an announcement of the EOSS2 uh, awardees uh, very soon, hopefully over the next two weeks. And then sometime between mid to late June, we will open up the portal for round three. Uh, I really hope that, that folks here uh, will apply for that. 
Uh, even if you've applied in prior rounds and were not funded, uh, we do encourage uh, reapplication. And I've included a, a link here to the RFA, RFA page um, that will open up, like I said, in, uh, in mid But finally, I just wanted to say that you know we we're under no uh, pretense that we are solving this problem right now. Uh, part of the the ongoing effort of us within the Open Science Program is to see if we can contribute to some of the larger conversations around enabling sustainable funding for uh, these foundational aspects of, of the research endeavor. Um, I, I tip my hat to the Software Sustainability Institute in the UK. I think it's done a lot of the foundational work for how we can think about sustaining open source software for, for research. Um, we're also, as I mentioned before, trying to bring together a coalition of, of funders and, and ultimately perhaps provide a, a template and proof of impact for uh, larger scale governmental funding around these resources. And, and you know, in addition, there's the, the aspect of institutional budgets and the extent to which research, research departments within universities um, should perhaps supplement slicing uh, existing grant monies to support these things to think of, thinking about more dedicated uh, software research uh, funding within the university environment. And what I think all of us can do really is to you know, recognize ultimately the, the people that are behind uh, these software packages and to, to think about ways that we can continue to call them out by, by citing, citing and crediting the creators of the software that we use. And that, that applies to software, uh, to data, to protocols, et cetera. And so with that, I thank you and we'll take some questions. Thank you very much, Alex. That was a, a very great talk. Um, we have some questions coming in. Uh, initially, I'll start off, and I, I was just wondering what you think the major advantages and also the limitations are for open, uh, using open software with actually within a company, because as you mentioned, a lot of open software is used in the kind of research area, but not really taken up by companies. I was wondering what you're, you're feeling more uh, on that. <laughs> um, I, I don't think that's a true statement necessarily. I mean, I think if you look at, a, at companies, you know, especially like um, uh, Google and uh, Facebook, uh, there's a lot of software projects. There, there's sort of there's directionality that I think is involved here. So there's software that that starts out um, as private software that then gets spun out as open source, and then there's open source uh, software uh, that is sort of brought in house, and that that directionality works both. Uh, both ways. Um, when you think about the you know, Amazon model, for example, a lot of things that they're hosting within their cloud environment started originally either developed within Amazon or were brought in uh, as external uh, projects. So I think when you're talking about sort of major uh, platform level uh, databases and uh, services like Cassandra and others, uh, I, I don't, I, I, I see um, uh, this sort of very much embedded this may not necessarily be the same within uh, pharma, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but even that, I think, is a it's a mixed model. I mean, some things are, and some things uh, people start to keep uh, more proprietary. Um, within my own career, I spent about uh, 17 years at Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft within the Windows organization, and then about eight years within Microsoft Research. And I was there during a very significant uh, uh, tide change within that organization where they started from one point saying that open source software was uh, was anathema, you know, we, we can't use it, we don't believe in it, developers weren't allowed to bring in software packages, we weren't allowed to contribute to open source software packages, and it was sort of two separate worlds. By the time that I left, and over the last four years, um, and, you know, significantly um, impacted by uh, Dr. Tony Hay, who's now back in, in the UK, um, we we really led a revolution in the way that, that Microsoft thought about software to the point now where um, uh, licenses you know you get a little bit into the weeds there, but you know, to the point where Microsoft is actively now participating in open source software projects, and Microsoft uh, engineers are actively encouraged to bring in relevant packages into the software that they're working on. So, so I mean I do think that this. Is, over the past decade, things have changed even in, in companies that, that formerly wouldn't have existed. 
Um, we have one question here from Faris Naj. Uh, have you advice for European SME to help the open source, uh, open science initiative? Uh, to, put, to help our open science initiative? It could be, yes. Uh, I don't know whether they can confirm that. I think it is your open science initiative. Uh, well, uh, send, send me an email. I didn't put my email on here, unfortunately. Send me a, a direct message in, in Twitter. Um, we can talk about that. One area that we are, um, so, so let me sort of back up and, and say two things in response to that. Um, CZI has a very strong preference right now towards competitive RFAs for the, for the grants that we give out um, in general. Within the Open Science Program, we're a combination of targeted grants, which is some of the things like Protocols.io, uh, uh, BioArchive, for example, were, were targeted grants. Uh, and then the Essential Open Source Software for Science is really our sole funding venue right now that uh, is under a competitive RFA. Over time, we certainly want to expand the number and, and types and flavor of things that we're funding through competitive RFAs. Um, uh, when we do that, we are constantly in need of finding uh, SMEs, both in terms of the science, as well as in terms of the open source technology aspects of that to serve as uh, external reviewers for, uh, for our packages so, uh, or for our applications. So for the EOSS program, I think we have about, I'm gonna say roughly two dozen um, external reviewers uh, so for the applications that we receive in, um, everything goes through at least two internal reviews, both from a domain scientist as well as from a technologist. And then we take a subset of those and we send them out to external reviews where they go through a further three reviews each. And so it's in that latter category where we are always interested in, in finding people who help uh, work with us as external reviewers on, on things. Right now it's the open source software, um, but, but moving forward it may be. Okay, perfect. Uh, it it so does create a, a COI situation, which means that your year you can't also be applying. <laughs> so Sergio Mas says, uh, what can you take from Elixir's approach to prioritize core data resources to help with your attempt to prioritize funding for software maintenance? Uh, I, I, I'm in awe of the stuff that Elixir is doing. And, and one of the things that I didn't really uh, refer to, uh, allude to much is, uh, when I talked about the meta software package that, that we're working on right now, um, I, I sort of moved between the open science program on the funding side of the house and the, and the technology side with, with meta. Um, and a, a lot of the things that, that Elixir is doing uh, are of interest to us, both in our scientific research internally, as well as some of our machine learning aspects in, in mining the literature. So um, I, I, as soon as you downloaded the, or, uploaded the Elixir industry strategy uh, at the beginning here. Um, that, that's certainly something that I, I want to have further conversations between CZI and, and Elixir on, on how we can uh, work together, share resources, uh, provide more visibility to your resources, and also for, for our, our team to be able to leverage more of that. I, I wish we had more uh, uh, hub and spoke model approaches like this in, in North America. Great. Uh Andy asks, uh, most funding programs typically focus on supporting research projects. And when they have specific support for infrastructure, it tends to be focused on support to databases. So the CSI focus on re software is refreshing. Do you sense more funding organization moving to supporting software in the future? Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, I sense it. Um, <clears throat> so I mentioned the um, uh, the convening the event that we held back at the end of February for the first mm. round recipients. We did at that time invite um, uh, a, a number, a small, smallish number of other funding agencies, uh, Welcome Trust, uh, NSF, NIH, Sloan Foundation, uh, Schmidt, I don't think somebody, maybe somebody from Moore Foundation, um, there, there's certainly um, interest and appetite there. You know, the extent to which that interest and appetite uh, materializes into into action, I, I can't comment on. It, it, it is a goal for us to continue to try to um, bring together these funders 
and there's another group um, that we are uh, a colleague of mine, Greg Tannenbaum, is the, is the convener for, is the uh, Open Research Funders Group, um, which has traditionally looked at the more sort of uh, research outputs in the terms of publications and preprints and, and other other areas, and they may also be taking a look at uh, at software funding as well. So I'm I'm cautiously optimistic that yes, there will be more uh, more interest in this from funding. Great. Uh, talking about preprints, how would you encourage more researchers to really submit to BioArchive? I mean, it seems to have got a lot of traction over the last few years, but you know, if you mentioned there they was still only full percent of the publications in PubMed, do you think we can get more, or, or is this a level that we can expect? I I absolutely think that this is going to go up. I think that um, sort of. Uh, community acceptance of preprints um, is is something that builds uh, upon itself. I think that there was oftentimes a lot of uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt of what it meant to publish a preprint. Would that preclude you from being able to publish in another publication? Uh, many journals, many publishers used to have explicit policies that said you cannot, you may not submit a manuscript to a journal if it had been priorly submitted as a preprint. And I think like some of the, the long standing holdouts to, to that uh, New England Journal of Medicine, you know, being one that comes to mind, um, have, have eliminated those policies in the, in the last couple of years. Now, eliminating those policies and eliminating those biases that exist within the community are not the same thing. And so I think as more researchers dip their toe into the water um, and see that it's an acceptable way. It doesn't prevent you from later submitting or even simultaneously submitting into a publication. Um, uh, I, I think it will, it will absolutely grow. One effort that's been uh, taking off, if you go back to one of my earlier slides there where I had the color-coded growth chart, is a an effort by Springer Nature uh, that they've only rolled out right now, I believe, to their uh, uh, BMC uh, publication, or sorry, uh, the, the Biomed Central publications is something called In Review, which allows you to submit a manuscript to one of the journals and simultaneously have a copy of that deposited into a Research Square preprint service. Hmm. And then they do a, a form of open peer review. So it's immediately available. The peer review is happening openly. And then if and when that, the, that preprint submitted manuscript gets accepted for publication, it will then uh, be formally published in the Springer Nature journal and the preprint will continue to exist. So you, you sort of have this uh, increased transparency and connectedness between a submitted manuscript as a preprint and then the final publication. Uh, and that, that, as I said, Springer Nature has only rolled that out to a limited number of their journals, uh, but already it's increasing uh, the number of preprints in, in biomedicine that's being published. And I've been told by Springer Nature that they do plan to uh, to expand that substantially to uh, most, if not all, of their publications over time. Okay, great. Uh, I think that is all the questions we have. So I'll thank you again, Alex, for a, a great keynote. And Kathy is here. So I think you'll round up now. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, let me just show my screen. Okay. Well, there's not, not much left to say apart from thank you very much to all our speakers um, for sticking around and, um, you know, preparing for this event, um, even though I am sure everyone has a lot of work and a lot of um, commitment uh, with their families at the moment. And um, I also wanted to say thank you to Natalia, Tom and Alessandro. He have um, consulted on the program of the event. Right. And um, then this is not the end. Um, we have turned some of the um, sessions that were planned as roundtable discussions at our face to face event into three virtual webinars focused around um, specific, more specific topics. Um, you can find all the details on our website if you're interested in attending 
those events. And again, please, if you do not want your details to be shared with other participants, then let me know. So now, um, as we couldn't ask all the speakers um, all questions that were posed posted during the event, you have now the opportunity to raise your hand and to ask um, the remaining speakers more questions if you, if you have um, something that you feel still needs to be addressed. Um, I can then unmute you and give you the opportunity to actually ask your question in person. So everyone who wants to ask another question, just raise your hand now. And the icon can be found in the control panel. Okay. Well, if there are no un unanswered questions, then I'm sure you can reach out to each of the speakers later. And um, just another thing um, for you to notice, I will make all the um, slides available as possible. Um, on our event website and we will also make the, this, the recording available um, on YouTube in the coming days. So yeah, thanks again for joining us today and um, I hope to see you soon at future events. And yeah, again, please fill out the um, feedback survey because it gives us important information on how to um, develop the program and our virtual events. Okay. So have a lovely evening and thank you and see you soon.